school district does hereby acknowledge that the district schools and facilities sit on the traditional lands of the Muwekma Ohlone people and the Board of Trustees further acknowledges with respect and reverence the Muwekma Ohlone people tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area for their stewardship of these lands. Uh, so with that, we will uh, please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we will now move to 1.02, discussion and or modifications of the agenda. The board may change the order of business, including but not limited to an announcement that an agenda item will be considered out of order, that consideration of an item has been withdrawn, postponed, rescheduled, or removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and possible actions. Is there a request to uh, uh, modify the agenda? Uh, Trustee Chavez. We would like to have a discussion on the School of Arts and Culture Mexican Heritage Plaza when it comes to the, um, the professional consultant services. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. So, so th that's just that's so there is no modification of the agenda. Okay, no, very well. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Uh, so seeing no uh, no call for. Okay, seeing no call for discussions or modifications of the agenda, we'll move to item 1.03. Welcome and explanation to the audience. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Carlos, is uh, will you go ahead and please uh, go ahead and provide the explanation to the audience? Thank you. Yes, I hear you. Okay, so with that, we'll move to uh, section two. Uh, public members who wish to address the board on matters not agenda, item 2.01. Uh, requests to address the board provides members of the public an opportunity to speak about any matter under the jurisdiction of the district, but not on this agenda. If the subject you wish to discuss is already on this agenda, please provide your comment when that item is called during the meeting. <clears throat> Those who wish to speak on an item within the jurisdiction of the district but not on this agenda should use the raise hand function on Zoom as described above when this agenda item 2.01 is called. The Brown Act prevents the board from discussing any item not on this published agenda, but the board may refer to staff for follow up any formal written requests that are brought before the board at this time. Uh, there is a limit of two minutes for each speaker. The board has the right to limit total public comment on any agenda item to no more than 20 minutes. Uh, written matters may be placed on a future meeting agenda. However, given the a length of the agenda, I will uh, I will limit uh, public comment to one minute per speaker tonight. So uh, with that, uh, Carlos, uh, do we have a public comment? Good afternoon, board president. Currently there are seven speakers. Maestra Diaz, uh, you have one minute. Please unmute yourself. The moment you unmute, the timer will begin. There are two speakers speaking. 
I am speaking to you all this evening as a form of communication since my request to meet with Dr. Bauer has been put out until February 15th by her. Please allow me to share how I am feeling after being publicly humiliated at the superintendent's meeting Thursday, January 26th at Adelante Academy. I am still feeling utterly disappointed, disregarded, and humiliated. I am still completely shocked two weeks later that Superintendent Bauer, Cesar Tarico, Jesus Arajo, and Trustee Herrera Loreda would allow a member of the community to discredit a teacher in such a manner. All of these individuals represent my employer, the Allen Rock School District, and they should have been there to support me. I expected Superintendent Bauer to have rejected, redirected those comments to a more appropriate time and place. I expected to have been supported, acknowledged, and valued at the exact moment. Given the nature of this meeting, it was an extension of my work environment, and Mr. Tarico failed to ensure the city free of hostility. I am reading this on behalf of Maestra Diaz. This incident has left me feeling demoralized, unvalued, and not supported by the district administration. These feelings are taking a toll on my health and on my moral. Unfortunately, Superintendent Bauer has not had the time to meet with me sooner to discuss my concerns from the meeting. Until then, my work environment continues to feel hostile and unhealthy. I am holding the ARD district accountable for what occurred on January 26th and for enabling a hostile work environment. If this happened to me directly in front of Ellen Rock administration, it can happen to any of us teachers at any time. This incident leaves me feeling devastated and helpless. So this evening, I ask all of you trustees and Superintendent Bauer, how do you plan on finding a resolution to this incident so that my colleagues and fellow teachers do not find themselves in this forsaken situation I currently find myself in? Remember, actions speak louder than words. Our next speaker is Ricardo Garcia. Ricardo, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening. Thank you very much for uh, taking my, my call. I'm Ricardo Garcia. I'm a lifelong resident of Allen Rock. I went to school in this district. I've been in this area for 50 years. I have two fourth grade students at Adelante. And my comments are specifically to the recent or not recent incidents uh, regarding the removal of a teacher there at the school. First of all, I, I wanna make a few important points. I'm pro-teacher. I'm a teacher myself, I'm a high school teacher and, and, and the teachers here in our district, they're undervalued and they're getting attacked regarding this incident. I, I really like to see the, the, the district and Dr. Bauer uh, taking a, a more proactive stance to, to let them know how important uh, an asset they are to our, to our uh, district and our community. Number two, I want to implore Dr. Bauer and the school board to. Our next speaker is Veronica Talton. Veronica, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin when you've been speaking. Good evening, trustees, Superintendent Bauer and school community. My name is Veronica Talton. I'm an African-American educator here in the district. I speak tonight on behalf of black students and educators who are experiencing racism, discrimination and prejudice in our schools. And I'll be reading an excerpt from James Baldwin's 1963 speech, A Talk to Teachers. It is a, the educational experience isn't about standardized testing and performance. It's a place for students to become holistic individuals who are cared for and protected. Educators must be leaders and advocates in this nation and support our students as they examine their society. Educators must be proactive in dismantling white supremacy and anti-Blackness in our educational institutions. If education is just and seeks to inspire equity and the values of true democracy, educators and the students they teach will transform our country to hold liberty and justice for all. And I end in honor of Tyree Nichols. Our next speaker is Jonathan Almerido. Jonathan, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin the moment you start speaking. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Almerido, and I'm a Filipino teacher here in Allen Rock. Uh, I also stand in solidarity with Black community members in our district who experience that racism, discrimination, and prejudice in schools that Veronica spoke of. 
Uh, I do this because as a non-Black person who's been in spaces where Black community members have shared their pains and the pains of other Black people, I believe them. And I demand that the district work towards eradicating anti-Blackness even in our schools and in our community. Um, it's important for everybody to have a Black person uh, who's a mentor in their life because it enables them to have um, a sense of empathy towards people who are uh, Black as well as uh, gives them sort of mentorship opportunities to learn and grow and understand the world better. Uh, I never had a Black adult figure in my life, and I know that um, my experiences as a kid would have been richer if I were able to learn from them. But above all, Black educators in our district deserve a place in which they're loved and cared for, and they deserve to be embraced by their places of work. Uh, thank you for listening. Our next speaker is Toby. Uh, Toby, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin the moment you begin speaking. Good evening. My name is Toby Nielsen. Good evening, board members and um, Superintendent Bauer and members of the Alam Rock community. I'm a teacher in this district and as a white identified, a white person, I'm also standing in solidarity with all black members of the Alam Rock community. Um, and I want to remind the board that on, Jan on July 9th of 2020, the area um, teachers brought a resolution with the, that asked that ARUSED commit to hiring and retaining additional black educators and administrators district-wide. Instead of that, we have lost black educators due to racism and I am appalled. I want to see the board step forward to this commitment. Thank you for listening to my comments. Our next speaker is Jose A. Miranda. Jose, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin the moment you begin speaking. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Jose Alejandro Miranda, and I'm a current student at St. Mary's College and former student at Adelante Dual Language Academy. I'd like to address this to Ms. Diaz. First of all, I hope you're doing well. About two weeks ago, my parents told me about, about an incident that occurred at a meeting two weeks ago where I was told um, words were directed towards you with negative connotations. When I was told this, I was infuriated that someone could have such bad words towards a teacher who has shaped my life. I began to reflect and acknowledge the vast support and help Ms. Diaz has granted me during my time in Adelante and beyond. She is a teacher who truly cares for students' success and pushes one of us to our limits. You care for students more than just inside the classroom. It is because of you that I am now a passionate dancer of Valle Forcorico. I'm a graduate of Bellarmine College Prep. I thank you for pushing, you not, pushing me not to reach my limits and take risk. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you have done for me as it has shaped me to be a great individual I am today. I truly wish that this incident would not have happened. And I want you to know that you have. Our next speaker is Raul Adelante. Raul, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. My concern is for our student school community and for our teachers. We need a strong, caring leader like our director Gutierrez was, one who will compliment, support, and carry out our hopes. We need to feel that our superintendent and board is going to move forward and make up for the lack of respect and transparency. We also need our superintendent to support and empower our teachers. With this said, I was upset that she allowed one of our teachers, La Maestra Diaz, to take a bashing from a former student who happens to be the daughter of a school board member. Especially when you stated that this meeting was not going to entertain any personnel issues yet you allowed this. On a personal note, yes, we need a director that could get us back or someone who is going to embrace and facilitate a healthy, successful school. We don't need a merry-go-round of administrators. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maya Gonzalez. Maya, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Maya Gonzalez. I am speaking on behalf of Maestra Diaz. I attended Adelante from kinder until I graduated eighth grade in 2016. I am currently a junior at Sacramento State majoring in child development. 
Maestra Diaz was my sixth and eighth grade teacher, but I had her a couple times before when she was substitute at Adelante. Maestra Diaz was the person who inspired the young woman I am today. She was the reason I decided I wanted to become a teacher. When I was in sixth grade, I was assigned to write an essay and Maestra Diaz used it to submit it to a writing competition where I was chosen as one of the finalists. Maestra Diaz is truly the reason I am who I am today. I would reach out to her in high school so that she would read my assignments because I valued her feedback. A couple years later, I made my confirmation and chose my idea to be my godmother. I can confidently say that I would not be where I am today without her courage, love, and continuous support. My ideas, if you're hearing this, I love you and I support you 100%. Our next speaker is Jimena Rocha. Jimena, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. Good evening, Alan Rock, distinguished board members and Superintendent Bauer. My name is Jimena Rocha and I am here to speak on my experience as an alumni of Adelante Dual Language Academy. I speak to you all today as a third year college student in the process of attaining my certification for teaching and I owe a large part of my achievements to the teachers at Adelante. Teachers like Maestra Diaz, who provide their students with the tools to succeed in all their future endeavors, and who have provided me with an outstanding example of what great teaching actually looks like. I firmly believe that Adelante teachers deserve to be treated with the utmost respect, not only by their students, but by the entire district board, because a lack of support for teachers directly translates into a disservice to the students. I proudly stand with Adelante teachers, and I can only hope that when I officially join the profession, I am allotted the same respect from my superiors as I hold towards the amazing educators that help shape the person I am today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danielle Banderas. Danielle, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Danielle, um, and I am a teacher at Lindale Elementary for 22 years. And from what I'm hearing, board members and Dr. Bauer, that teachers in this district are undervalued and, and underappreciated. And I just would like to say that moving into bargaining, which starts Monday, it's all about attracting and retaining teachers. We need to start there first. There is a sub shortage and we can't be having teachers during their preps filling those spots. Also board members and Dr. Bauer, it's not right that we are still in the bottom third in the county as far as salary goes. And just to throw out a couple numbers, our starting salary in Alum Rock is around 64,000, which is you know common knowledge. And the county average is around 67,000. So let's work together in the coming weeks to change that. And let's all work together to get a fair contract. Our next speaker is Ingrid Graciano. Ingrid, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening, Superintendent Bauer, Board of Directors and colleagues. I am Maestra Graciano and I teach at Adelante Dual Language Academy One. I would like to speak about the parent meeting that took place with the superintendent on January 26. I think those in the district that were present and facilitating should have followed the Roberts rules of order. For example, following the agenda to keep the group moving towards its goals. And when discussions get off track, gently guide the group back to the agenda. I stand by Maestra Diaz. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maestra Mendoza. Maestra Mendoza, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening, Dr. Bauer and trustees. My name is Teodolinda Mendoza and I'm a teacher at Adelante and I stand in solidarity with Maestra Diaz. Thank you. Our next speaker is Isaiah Martinez. Isaiah, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening, everyone. I am a, an, uh, 
I'm Alumni of Adelante. I'm currently an 11th grader in high school. My name is Rodolfo Isaiah Martinez, and I am I stand with Mazda Diaz. Maestra uh, Diaz taught me uh, to always uh, treat every student equal and help us to the best of our ability. She's always taught me how to start and finish summaries and essays during word questions. One thing I remember the most is after you're done reading a story in a textbook, you sometimes got to start with according to the text or I got this from page number and paragraph number. She's a great teacher and helped me develop a good education and English understanding over the years I spent in junior high. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Guzman. Elizabeth, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. Good evening, Dr. Bauer, board, of, board President and Trustees. My name is Elizabeth Guzman. I am a teacher at Adelante Dual Language Academy, and I stand in solidarity with Maestra Diaz. Thank you. Our next speaker is Judo Dave. Judo Dave, please unmute yourself. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. Good evening, board. This is David Williams. Uh, Dr. Bauer knows me quite well by now. Uh, my only comments are this. Number one, I still have not heard anything concerning what we're going to do with the seventh graders who were not able to do the uh, English, uh, I'm sorry, the Spanish uh, test that they usually take in fifth grade. That one, I'm sure you remember. I hope you could take care of that. The other thing is I've been concerned over the past, I don't know, couple of years now that I've heard from teachers at Adelante that they have fear of retribution from people uh, higher up, whether it be the board, board members, or whatever it is. I would hope that this is not true. I'm hoping that all I'm hearing is fear because they don't want to be seen as critiquing somebody. But if we are educators, part of what we our job is to do is to critique and to fix. Thank you for your time tonight. I hope we can do something about all this and clear up all the stuff that's going on. Our next speaker is Maestra Cruz. Maestra Cruz, please unmute yourself. When you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening, my name is Wendy Cruz Alcantar and I am a teacher at Adelante. I am in solidarity, I stand in solidarity with Maestra um, Diaz, thank you. Our next speaker is Joseph. Joseph, please unmute yourself. The moment, you, the moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Joseph, please unmute yourself. Hello everyone. My name is Joseph Salazar. I'm the alumni of Adelante Academy. I attended Adelante kinder through eighth grade. With that said, Adelante holds a place, a special place in my heart. I'm here today to give credit where it is due, and I like, and I like to give credit, and I like to point out that Academy Adelante teachers have been a big reason for my academic accomplishments. I specifically would like to point out a few. I'd like to specifically point out to Ms. Diaz that helped me so much throughout the years. Last year, um, when I was at my lowest, her positive attitude and endless words of courage men are what we push harder to attain my goals. Last, she, she helped me suggest a high school that would be fitting for, just for me. And because of that, I am, I am in my sophomore year of high school and I'm so proud to say I'm thriving. I have maintained a 4.0 GPA of Freshman and sophomore high school. I stand with Ms. Diaz. Our next speaker is Carlo Reina. Carlos Reina, please unmute yourself. When you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Greetings. My name is Carlo Reina, and I attended Adelante from kinder through eighth grade. 
During my time there, Ms. Diaz was by most, by far the most influential and caring person, teacher, and mentor. After hearing the, of the incident the student described with Ms. Diaz, I was shocked because Ms. Diaz is one of the best teachers I've ever had. She looked out for me, and even though she didn't know it, she helped me through some of my toughest times at home. Adelante, she helped me develop my writing skills and taught me so much about my culture. She always believed in me and supported me. She connected me with the Bellarmine Summer School Program, to which I used to later attend on full scholarship. In addition, she still checks in on me to this day about my experience at USC, where I'm also going on full scholarship. Ms. Diaz cares for her students, and without her, I surely would not have the success I do today. I stand in solidarity with Ms. Diaz. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erlinda Munoz. Erlinda, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Erlinda, please unmute yourself. Okay, I will move to the next speaker. Tina Lopez. Tina, please unmute yourself. The, the moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Hello, my name is Tina Lopez and I stand with Maestra Diaz and all of Adelante teachers. Uh, Maestra Diaz helped my son who started in sixth grade at Adelante and struggled um, for you know a couple of years. Um, and in eighth grade, you know, she really structured him into, um, you know, getting his education and supported me as a parent uh, to be a better mother and, uh, you know, to support his education. Um, coming this year, he's a junior, currently receiving many awards um, and appreciate, you know, and I appreciate the teachers from Adelante for structuring him into a man that he's going to become. Um, I stand with Adelante and Maestra Diaz. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maestra Gonzalez. Maestra Gonzalez, please unmute yourself. When you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening. My name is Maricruz Gonzalez, and I am a teacher at Adelante One and a parent of students at Adelante and former student of, of Adelante. I stand, I stand strong in solidarity with Maestra Diaz. Thank you. Our next speaker is Graviela Ortega. Graviela, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Hi, my name is Gabriela Ortega and I was Mrs. Diaz student in 2020 to 2021. Mrs. Diaz was incredibly helpful and never and made sure that she answered my text messages whenever I needed extra help on something. I was still adjusting to online school and I got all the help I needed from her when I reached out and expressed my academic worries and she always reminded me that she was there for me if I ever needed her and always stuck by her word. She was an incredible light and went above and beyond to support me in my application process to the current private school I go to. I asked her for help on my application essays and she was nothing short of incredible help. I benefited from her support and to this day I have so much gratitude for her. Mrs. Diaz also gave the entire class of 2021 her phone number to contact her about any issues or extension requests and would take the time out of her day to make sure every one of her students was okay. I stand by Mrs. Diaz. Our next speaker is Jose Miranda. Jose, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Uh, good evening, my name is Jose Miranda. And I stand with my ideas and I want to share something that I wrote for her. Um, I just wanted to reach out to you to see how you're feeling after last night's meeting at the school. As, as for me, I was disappointed that someone can go up there and say these things about you and nothing was done to stop it. You are one of the best teachers at Adelante there. You have done so much for our kids, Jose and Victoria, that Victoria even wants to be a teacher now. Students that have had you have, have been so lucky. You are so dedicated to your job and always wants best what's for the kids. 
that was totally uncalled for for that girl to go up there and speak bad things about you. The superintendent should have just stopped that girl from talking. The meeting was for the parents to talk to the superintendent. But it's funny how a parent right after goes up there to talk good things about you and she was and the superintendent stopped that parent from talking. That makes no sense. I just want I just want you to know that you have you are a our next speaker is Laura Fuentes. Laura, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening. My name is Laura Fuentes. I am a teacher at Adelante One. I stand in solidarity with Maestra Diaz. I am also a mother of two former students that Ms. Diaz had as students there at Adelante. I can only speak great things about Maestra Diaz and how supportive, what an amazing teacher she was to both of my sons. Unfortunately, we've all been sick at home and they couldn't be here to talk about her, but they did leave a couple of words for her. And I'm just gonna read a little portion of what one of my oldest um, wrote to her. And it says, Maestra Diaz, I am thankful for everything you've done for me from day one. You've been there for me all the time. I can't express how much I care about you. And when I heard what someone went up there and talked those things unnecessary and it was uncalled for. I want you to know that you have. Our next speaker is Nadia Miranda. Nadia. Please unmute yourself. When you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Hello, my name is Nadia Miranda, a mom of a Adelante student and a former student. I stand for Maestra Diaz and all Adelante teachers. Our next speaker is Israel Stone. Israel, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Israel Stone. I am the uh, parent of uh, two students that are currently enrolled in Adelante. And I wanna tell everybody in the board and everybody listening that Adelante's greatest asset are their teachers. Uh, I send both of my kids and I commute from Campbell specifically for this reason. So I would like to express uh, my gratitude with all the teaching staff at Adelante, uh, especially Maestra Diaz. Um, we have the fortune of uh, having a, one of my, uh, my sons uh, go um, uh, be in one of her classes and she is nothing short of caring, uh, very professional, very clear. Uh, and that's, I think what we should focus on is personal accountability. Uh, uh, rather than um, accusations and such. Thank you everybody for your time. Our next speaker is Maestra Belman. Maestra Belman, please unmute yourself. When you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Maestra Belman, please unmute yourself. Our next speaker is Ellen Arneson. Ellen, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Good evening, my name is Ellen Arneson and I am a teacher at Adelante Academy. Uh, first, I just want to say that it's been extremely beautiful to hear so many former students um, coming to speak out in support of their teacher. And I would like to say that I stand in solidarity with Maya Shadias. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mrs. Tanner. Ms. Tanner. Please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Hello, uh, thank you for listening. My name is uh, Ms. Tanner. I work at Curitan and the Curitan teachers 
across the board stand in solidarity with the Adelante teachers. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patricia Sarkis. Patricia, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Oh, hello, I'm Patricia Sarkis. I work at Adelante Academy and I had my two kids are former students in Adelante and I just have nice words for Maestra Diaz. She always support them. And I have one kid that gave her a lot of trouble. And I also remember all the things that she's doing and also going far and beyond, going, taking the kids to Washington to have more experiences. Thank you, Mr. Maestra Diaz for all your hard work. This is not fair what they're doing. Um, we're going to circle back to our last speaker, Ms. Erlinda Munoz. Erlinda, please unmute yourself. When you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. hear me but if you can my name is Elinda Munoz and I am a teacher at Adelante and I stand in solidarity with Maestra Diaz and the teachers at Adelante. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Garza. Nancy please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking the timer will begin. Good evening everyone my name is Maestra Garza, and I stand in solidarity with my colegas at Adelante. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adelante Que Pasa. Adelante Que Pasa, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Hello, I am a community member of Adelante. And I'm very frustrated with the lack of communication from the district on the status of our directora Gutierrez. She was too amazing to have been thrown out. I am disgusted with the district personnel who did not even flinch when Maestro Diaz's name was being trashed at the meeting with Superintendent Bauer. Trustee Quintero, you should step down for all the troubles you have caused at Adelante. Dr. Bauer, you too, should be reconsidered as superintendent. Thank you. Board President, there is no more public comment. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further public comment, we'll move to section three, special presentation, discussion, consideration, and action. Uh, item 3.01, PSS will provide an update of the uh, DSA closeout process. Uh, Superintendent, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I want to ask Mr. Chen to be promoted to a panelist, please. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Good evening, uh, board president, members of the board and superintendent, Dr. Bauer. Um, so tonight uh, we're inviting Ms. Natasha Knudsen with PSS who will be providing an update of the uh, DSA closeout process. Um, if we can promote Ms. Natasha Knudsen, um, that'd be great. Is it Natasha Melendres? 
Is that her? Uh, I believe so. She might have a different. Let me check. It's it's Natasha Melendrez Knutson. I've I kept my last name, but I say Knutson to keep my husband happy. You know what we do. So yes. Hello. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you, Ms. Knutson, um, for being here tonight. Um, when you're ready, please uh, proceed with the presentation and update. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to share my screen because I want to be able to give a presentation. So um, hello, my name is Natasha Melendres Knutson. I've been doing DSA closeout and certifications in the state of California now for about 16 years. We've assisted over 50 districts. Um, I call myself, you know, the Michael Phelps, the Beyonce of getting projects certified with the state. Now, I do not want to waste um, your time. So I would first love to ask just really quick, how familiar you as the board are you with the DSA closeout in uh, project certification? Because if you're like, we're pretty familiar, then I can move quick to some other slides. If you're like, no, we don't understand this. I do want to hit a couple key points for you. Okay, uh, I uh, he if you would go over the uh, the presentation as planned, that would be best. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, perfect. All right. So every time a project is built with a division of state architect, it needs to be constructed per exactly the plans. Um, here's a lot of language in here. I'm going to provide the district with a copy. But if you don't build those projects per plan, like you told the state, fire life structural and access they're going to issue a non-certified report. What we do is we come in and figure out what the issues are. So I'm going to move ahead to the closeout types. Now, why is the closeout and certification really important? Two things. Number one, if you have future construction that your district needs to proceed with and your architect submits plans, DSA is going to say, nope, your projects weren't certified. Get those closed out first, and then we'll let you move forward because they want to make sure if there's a fire, nothing that the fire department and the alarms are going to go off. They want to make sure if anyone has ADA issues, wheelchair, um, they're blind, they're deaf, that they know where the classrooms are at. And last but not least, if there's an earthquake, they want to make sure that these buildings will withstand and nothing's going to happen. So that's why there's a due diligence. Also, last but not least, um, I don't like saying it, but it is very important for you to know as the board is you are personally liable if anything happens. So if a project's not certified and Lord forbid there's an earthquake and something happens and it wasn't certified with the state, the board members are liable. That is extremely important to the district that they get these closed out so that you're not. And then all your projects move forward with their programs. Um, any questions yet? No, not in the moment. Okay, perfect. So I want to, I want to, explain to you, let's talk about your status, what's going on with your district. That's really important. So before PSS was hired, you had a total of 52 non-certified projects. 52 is a lot, but um, we came in with our cape on and we said, how can we get this number down immediately? So we worked with, um, we worked with Coviro, we worked with the CM firm and off the bat, last year when we were contracted, we have 18 projects that were certified very quick. And we actually found a project that wasn't constructed. So guess what? You got a $54,600 refund check. That's supposed to be coming into the mail to you from the state. Keep in mind, that is the largest, largest refund check I've ever been able to get a client. So I do take a lot of pride in that because the state always collects their money. They never give money. Now, where are you at today? That's the most important part. You have 38 non-certified projects. We are currently contracted 16 because how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. We can't do this all at one point. So we agreed as a team, let's focus on the projects that are going to um, hold up projects from plan approval. And let's focus on the easy ones to get them out. And then we'll deal with those really difficult ones that aren't affecting anything later. So currently we have 16 projects contracted and great news of those 16, we have seven ready to go to the state. So out of those 16, we're solely focusing on nine of those projects. Any questions so far? So far, so good. Okay. Now, closeout's like a game. There, you're probably wondering, man, we see PSS's contract 
coming a couple of times. And there's two reasons why. So when I started my business off about 15 years ago, we would send one contract and we would start working on the projects, but then we'd find all these issues, AKA scope creep. So we'd have to go to the board again and request a change order. Knowing board members coming to you twice is not a good thing. So if we come to you once and say, here's what we're doing, and then we come to you again and you're prepared for it, it builds trust with you. So in our first contract, we we do investigative work. We review the files. We re read the plans. We do a site survey. Our goal is to do everything we can to get it certified in a contract one, like many of those projects we did. However, sometimes the projects are so complex, like, ADA wasn't done. A lot of your projects, ADA was not done at all. So we have to send someone out to do a site survey. And then we have to end up making sure that work gets constructed or else the state won't sign off. So after that point, we then create a phase two scope of work plan of action. And we negotiate with the state. We want to make sure that they're not going to want more than what we're proposing. It's like we go to court with them. After the, pro uh, the program is approved, then we move forward with the district and we get the projects certified once they are done. So those um, remaining nine projects that I was talking to you about, they're in this middle phase right here. And our goal is to get them across, to get them certified at milestone 16. So you have been getting some proposals where we get them done in phase one, which we've done a lot. And then we have some that we can't do that because we have to do construction still. So does anyone have questions about this process? Nope, not at the moment. Okay, perfect. And that pretty much leads in the conclusion of, I explained to you why this is important to get the projects closed out, why we were brought on, um, why we do this in two phases, where you're at today, where you want to be as a district, and what we're doing as a company to get you there. And that's pretty much the conclusion end of my presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Natasha. And... All right, I'd like to open this to a public comment at this time. Uh, is there any comment from the public on item 3.01? Board President, there's currently no public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, I'll move to questions and comments from members of the board. Is there, are there any? Okay, okay, Trustee Chavez. So right now, if anything happens, what board is liable? The ones that first started it or the, this board, the current board? The current board, because the current board in seat right now, they're the ones that are aware. They're the ones that know of this. And you don't really know of it at times going on, but that's what the guide and the regulations say. So um, us working with Covira and the construction management firm, we are making sure none of these would ever put you at risk. And we are closing them out as fast as possible. And after reviewing them, Many of them don't put you at risk. We, they just need to get the construction scope completed, which is ADA. Okay, any further questions from members, uh, questions or comments from members of the board? Okay, I just have one question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned personal risk. Uh, what, what, what type of risk does it entail? Is it some sort of individual risk or, you know, a collective risk as a, as a legislative body. Okay, so when I say risk, there's a certain type of project called a number four with a state, and those are not good projects. And they're, they're really risky projects because something is structurally wrong with them. The building is not safe and kids shouldn't be in there. That's the first thing I do when I work with the district. I make sure you have no number four, as they're called, and your district has zero. So that's why I was like, okay, whew, we're safe there for the district. Okay. Uh, All right, uh, Trustee Chavez. Uh, so you say those are called number fours. And then the next one that is not as risky, what are they called? Those are called number threes. And those are closed without certification due to exceptions of documentation or scope of work that was not constructed or constructed differently per plan. How many of those currently do we have? You have a total of 38 right now. And then keep in mind, seven are going to come off that list because we have seven ready to be certified. And we're focusing on nine right now. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty. Well, seeing no further questions and comments from the board, I thank you, Natasha, for uh, presenting this informative report for us and that we're 
making uh, good progress on closing out these projects. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for hiring a small woman minority owned business. I beyond appreciate the work and we promise not to let you down. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. Uh, moving on to item uh, 3.02. Uh, LPA and ARC alternatives will provide an update of the facilities master planning process. Uh, Superintendent, you have the floor. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Chen. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Uh, for this next presentation, we would like to invite Ms. Um, Andrea Pippen from LPA, Ms. Mariana Levezo from LPA, and Mr. Russell Driver uh, from ARC Alternatives to provide an update on the facility master planning process. Um, so if we can elevate those three individuals, um, that would be great. Thank you. What were the other names, Colvera? I, I don't see Russell. Here in the... um, Russell Driver. Yeah, I don't see him. And what were the other two? You mentioned. Let's see, uh, Mariana Lavezo is there. Mariana, okay, I see her. Um, Arc Alternative. The name Arc Alternative, Maribel. I see Mark. No, Ark, A-R-C. Oh, he, he, Brett's got it. Yeah. And Andrea Pippen. She's the first one on the list. Hello, good evening. Mariana, would you like to begin? I'll share my screen here. Great, thank you. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees. Thank you for having us. I'll begin by, uh, we're here to share with you an update of the work that we've done so far on um, the strategic um, district master plan. So this is a roadmap of the things that we're gonna highlight. We're gonna explain uh, what our scope is and, and a bit about the process and the schedule. Then we'll share with you um, how the facility condition assessments are being done and an example of how we'll synthesize that for you. And then we'll talk about the work we've done with the educators. We started first uh, with uh, the design guidelines. So we met with the educators and then we went to all the campuses. So we'll share our findings in those two realms. And then Andrea will share um, how we're using data visualization for well-informed decisions. And then Russell will wrap it up with the energy master plan. And then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, as we go along, we'll just pause and ask if anybody has questions. Um, but there will be time at the end for questions as well. Okay, so go to the next slide. It's showing schedule on my screen. Just the blue, blue slide is showing right now. Might be a little lag. There we go. Okay, so just to kind of run through what are all the different scope categories, I'm not going to go into any detail. You have a PDF of this. But um, there's a lot of uh, moving parts and pieces. Uh, one thing that is continuous is community outreach in different forms all throughout the process from start to finish. Uh, so we're in the process of uh, getting a survey translated for the community and the staff and teachers. Um, the one for the community will be translated into Spanish and Vietnamese. So that'll be coming out soon. It'll be on SurveyMonkey. Uh, we'll definitely get a high percentage of respondents because we'll have students do it in class. And then we'll have um, site admin, have staff and teachers do it on site. And so our 
our energy will be focused on really getting the community to engage. Um, so just starting with uh, what's been done, data collection and facility assessments, we'll go over that. That's where we have a team, Bureau Veritas, that specializes in this work. They're going, they went through every campus, did a very comprehensive report about the condition of uh, the site and the buildings. Um, then we have um, another consultant working with us on the capacity and funding analysis at CL Consulting um, that um, also has an, an amazing track record like um, Nastasia was saying she does for DSA closeout. So I feel like we have a nice dream team here. I, did, I didn't know that Nastasia was part of this um, or working with the district. And then uh, for EdSpecs, those are, that's simply um, the California Department of Education's lingo to say design guidelines. So that's uh, really important that we work with the educators to get that vision so that we translate that into uh, the design guidelines that future architects and engineers will use when they execute projects that are in this strategic plan. So we'll go over that. And then of course we mentioned um, ARC alternatives is doing the energy decarbonization plan. Uh, we're in the process of doing a universal TK analysis. So we wanna see which campuses have the capacity to move to a full-time TK. Um, and then I'll go through the schedule and explain when the cost estimate and dashboard preparation comes into play and what that means exactly as far as the dashboards. And wrap, bringing it all together is the master planning and prioritization. Um, so I'll explain that a bit more. That's where the rubber really hits the road and we need to make some decisions about um, which projects to prioritize to have the most impact. So the next slide. So I just wanted to say the process is data driven and synergistic in that the built environment data is uh, where we're doing the quantitative analysis of getting the condition, just the physical condition of the buildings, not how effective they are for education. Um, that comes from working with the educators uh, when we see what do we need to do to meet the mission, mission and vision of the district and, and transform these environments to be um, preparing students to thrive and succeed in the 21st century. So we know um, in America, most of our, our public school buildings are lagging behind um, the how education is being delivered in a different way where it's more student-centered and we're recognizing that, that all humans um, think and work in different ways. And so we need our environments to support them finding out how they can be expert learners and learn in the ways they learn best while not making this difficult for the teacher to be in this new role of facil facilitating learning instead of like spoon feeding lecture-based learning only as was done um, in the past when we were preparing students for um, industrial, industrial society back then. Um, and then the equity framework is simply saying, the whole point of this strategic plan is that we wanna get equity district-wide. So one school might have something that another school doesn't have, and that's an example of lack of equity, but even on a campus, there might be, for example, um, one campus might have um, a STEAM lab or a science lab, um, and it depends on which teacher you get, if you get the old one or the new one, right? So within a campus, we wanna make sure that learning is also equitable. So next slide. And so then just adding another layer of showing like, it's also um, people oriented. So we're um, working with, um, at the, and at the center of it, like I said, the common thread is community. So um, I'll go over the different types of community outreach that we're doing. So far, I've only mentioned the survey that's coming out, but tonight we're gonna share with you what we've done so far. Next slide. So as far as the schedule, uh, we'll be finishing this um, strategic plan by October, 2023. And um, where we are today is um, still in the thick of the community outreach. So I'll share with you um, what we've done with the educators, what we've done with the campuses, and we'll share um, how, how the facility condition assessments work. So what I wanted to point out is when we do that estimate of probable costs, that's like May through July, 
after we've had town hall meetings where um, the whole community is invited to see the site designs for every campus so they can give input. And so uh, those will be um, costed out in what's called a rough order of magnitude estimate. So it goes a little bit high to make sure that then when you roll out these projects, you're set up to succeed and you're not finding that um, the projects are over budget. So there's a little cushion built in there to be conservative. And uh, once we get those costs, then we're able to do the project prioritization exercise, which is where we give you the data in a way that's easy to digest so you can make the most well-informed decision. So we'll talk about that more at the end. All right, now I'll jump in with the facility condition assessments. So in any process, we like to start off with what are we working with? Um, and we've uh, partnered with a, a, contract, a, a second contracting firm, Bureau Veritas, who really know these nuts and bolts type of systems. Um, and as Mariana mentioned, have walked every single campus, taken a look inside every classroom, um, been walked on all of your roofs to take a look at each and every building system, component, finish, furniture, uh, piece of equipment to to produce these reports. They're reports that are 100 plus pages long, um, but we try to distill that information down into something that is more consumable when it's put out on this uh, planning website. What we've noticed so far from these reports um, are they've listed some immediate needs. The reports then go on to um, identify things that will need to be replaced or um, repaired over the life of this facility's plan and beyond. We're actually looking out about 20 years um, according to their facility condition assessments. Um, there's lots of tables and charts that show based on when a system or finish or piece of equipment, whatever it is, was installed, what is its life expectancy, and what is that year that the district can expect it to need to be replaced. So that's the whole broad, broader piece. They've also identified some immediate needs across all campuses. This is just uh, some common themes that we've seen pop up in these immediate needs. It's not to say that every site has all of these issues, but these are the most common themes that we've seen occurring at multiple sites. So additional studies um, being needed for accessibility um, or underground systems such as plumbing, mechanical um, features, mechanical components like the HVA systems that are currently in disrepair, possibly at few campuses, restroom components, toilet sinks, et cetera. You can read the list there. So we're identifying immediate needs. Um, because those will, of course, become uh, a high priority when we look at the whole picture. The facility condition um, for each campus, as I said, it's a 100 plus page, very heavy technical report. We'll try to break it down into something that's more digestible. So as we look at all of the systems and and you everything that that has been assessed, each site will get a report card. Here's, an, here's a sample report card from Kirtan. We can see the costs, you know, broken out and analyzed in this numerical form. That numer numerical form is then converted into a grade. So the higher the number, the better the grade. In this case, Kirtan's uh, numerical rating translates into a B minus when we're looking at giving it a grade. So we're, we'll be turning each of these facility condition assessments into something that is more manageable, that is very quick and easy to see, and can be um, can be uh, placed in a line with all of the other school sites. This will feed into a site ratings analysis that we'll be developing, rolling in uh, multiple factors that I'll get into towards the end of this presentation. Um, so we're looking at, for that site ratings, looking at the facility condition and also other ratings. For example, the age of the school. Um, this is using Woodland Joint USD as a sample. Um, but in this case, Woodland, their schools were built between 1912 and 2022. So taking that range, um, dividing it into five different categories, you can see how we develop these grades for each of the different factors that we consider when we look at including it in a site ratings analysis. 
So depending on the date it was constructed, it fall into one of these five categories just due to that spread of the data. And now getting more on the softer side, I'll pass it back to Mariana. Great. Uh, you're cutting out a little bit, but let's see, hopefully I'm not. So um, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about the work that we did with the educators initially, as soon as we started. So next slide. So uh, we started with a, a kickoff meeting and had two afternoon workshops um, where we did some visioning. And we, the vehicle we did it was having um, five child personas described that were in the um, most challenging circumstances outside of school. So we know that uh, the children bring that with them to school and that's part of what we have to factor in supporting them. And so if we can design the learning environment to support um, kids that have the most challenging circumstances, then it, it'll work for everybody. So it's really um, about an empathetic design exercise, putting yourself in, yourself in the shoes of that child today and walking through what is their life like today? How do they spend their time at school and how are they feeling? And then we did um, some more visioning in between that where we came back to the same ex exercise at the very end and we had them walk through what is that child's life going to be like in 15 years if we can make all these changes um, to make the school experience um, better for them. So next slide. So, um, you know, in the PDF that we sent out at the end, you have links to all the reports if you wanna dig deeper. We're just going through and giving you um, kind of the, the highlights and the scoop. So the result of those two days was um, these lists came from them. So we, we took all the notes that we were scribing and we categorized them into four categories, empowering students to become expert learners, higher collaboration, equity for students and their families, and mind, body, and spirit. So you can see how most of the comments were really about empowering students to become expert learners. That was a very strong theme um, that children should feel like school is where they have control of their lives. A lot of children don't have that outside of school. They're in circumstances that they didn't choose to be in. And so here's a place where they can really take ownership of their learning and feel empowered and not feel like school is something that's uh, being done to them. So um, the main gist of that is like, you know, pulling out some words from there. It's about mind, body, and spirit, helping students find their spark, help them keep that curiosity they were born with, become expert lifelong learners, and everybody gets an equal chance to thrive. Next slide. So then from that, we uh, put together this first draft um, and it, it will probably be wordsmith a little bit, but for now, um, I'll, I'll read it in case anybody's on their phone and it's too small. So ARUSD's learning environments will support students' development of mind, body, and spirit. They will be empowered with the opportunity to try different ways of learning to discover how they learn best, find their spark, and to keep the curiosity they were born with to become expert lifelong learners. ARUSD will work to give students and families who need additional support to have an equal chance to thrive, meeting all their needs. Next slide. So after we had the two afternoons of workshops, I think we had about 20 educators. Um, then we saw the emerging patterns from that of what are the areas that we really need to focus on. So we. We have a lot of expertise in, in um, K-12 design, and we've done over 75 master plans in California and ed specs, but every school is different. So this is where we can really tailor um, what would be considered you know, standard for meeting the California Department of Ed requirements. This isn't just about meeting the requirements, but it's really giving you a document that you can work with future architects and engineers so they can use these as design guidelines to um, have parameters so that your schools have consistency, but then they're not cookie cutter where we're applying the same solutions to every school and every school looks, looks the same. So we had um, three student focus groups. We had um, what the district felt was kind of a good cross section. We weren't 
um, working on their specific campus. And we work, when we worked with them, we told them this isn't about your campus specifically. Um, you're working on district wide, like what does the whole campus need? And then um, the other subjects were just the focus group topics that we drilled down in to get more detail on. So yeah, here are some pictures of us working with the students. We all had a great time. Um, there are a lot of great ideas. I think one big nugget that I took away was that middle schoolers are really, uh, a lot of them big, still big kids. They are on, some of them on campuses where there is elementary school and they wish they could play on the play structure and they could um, be doing gardening. So um, that's um, one insight that we have, we had from working with the students. Um, but they're very specific about a lot of things that they love and, and would like to have more of. So it was great, they're all very positive. Next slide. So in those focus group interviews, we had a dozen focus group interviews on different topics. Um, I'm sharing with you an example of the English, um, the emerging bilingual students um, known as English language learners focus group. And so we asked them a set of, of questions um, to kick, kick it off. So we explained to them what a master plan and what ed specs are design guidelines, but then we structure the interview around these questions and we um, scribe their input and then we put together a report. So we always start with asking them, is there anything that you've seen maybe in professional development or you have colleagues that work somewhere else or it could be something, you know, in, could be in your district, outside of your district in California or, you know, somewhere in the world, like what is something exemplary that you've seen? So we always start with that question. And then the other questions are just tailored um, to really understand how can we give you some guidelines that are gonna help you uh, be able to facilitate learning and, and translate that, that vision into the environment so that it's supporting um, the, the vision for educational delivery that, that you have, that your district has. Next slide. So um, overall, a common thread that we saw out of all these EdSpecs um, focus groups interviews is we want spaces that engage students and support a sense of belonging where learners feel safe and ready to learn. So four components are that. It was like, we really need flexibility. We need that furniture and technology and space to be able to reconfigure things or allow students to do different activities simultaneously in one space or extend the space out to, to expand the footprint to the outdoors or to a shared area. Um, spaces to collaborate more highly, both indoors and outdoors. And then um, working to support the inquiry-based learning cycle came up where you need a variety of spaces that are gonna support that. And then uh, environments that are culturally responsive um, and can also be shared with the community. Next slide. So I pulled together uh, just some imagery to um, illustrate what we mean by those words. So different ways of learning on the upper left, you can see um, a play area that's got loose parts. It's not a traditional play apparatus um, that becomes predictable, but instead, you know, this is these materials are stored in an outdoor um, container that's weatherproof. And it's also something that can be used to learn about science. Um, and then having a variety of seating, like giving learners a choice to sit and what suits them best, depending on the activity that they're doing. And then having a range of stimulation, some areas where you can go and be with the larger group or some areas where you can get away and be by yourself because you need to work independently or, or uh, maybe you're um, more of an introvert or you're just processing new knowledge. So um, giving students that, that power to choose where they need to be and, and what, what kind of um, seating or environment they need to be in. Next slide. So then uh, for the part of mind, body, and spirit for body is designing for movement and <clears throat> embodied cognition. So students, children are exploring space with their bodies and that's how they learn. Um, so it's important to have these elements. So again, on the upper left, you can see these aren't um, traditional play structures that are become predictable, but there are things that um, these children are using to learn about space. Um, and proprioception, like how their bodies work in space. 
Um, and even, you know, really like making the most out of the outdoors. There's a lot of opportunities. That was a common thread we saw after we did the educational um, visioning workshops that going to each campus, it reaffirmed um, that we can use the outdoors in many ways. And it doesn't have to be something um, necessarily really grand and elaborate. There's just like a lot of lost opportunities right now, a lot of small moves we can make with this outdoor space that we have. Um, and then making sure that indoor spaces, we're getting students to move their bodies because oxygen goes to the brain when you get up out of your chair. We don't want kids all sitting in a row the whole time um, facing the front. We want them to get up and get out of their chairs and interact and collaborate. Next slide. And for spirit, um, really engaging the community. That's such an important part of what the district is about to really support their families, um, especially families in need. So really changing uh, or transforming the, the built environment to support what the district is about. So the district has some very robust programs. It does a lot to support families, but the buildings don't express that or support that very easily, even though that's still being done. So finding it to finding ways to make the environment more explicitly welcoming uh, from the moment you arrive at the campus and walk in into the admin. And um, like I was saying before, having these different types of spaces that allow for um, a different, different ranges of privacy, but still with supervision by adults. So this is just the cover of that report um, that we had for English language learners. That is in the PDF at the end. There's a link that takes you to all 12 reports. Next slide. So we're gonna jump now to after we got through um, getting the qualitative data from our workshops and our focus group interviews, then we went and visited each campus and we did uh, more interviews and walking through the campuses to learn on the campuses, uh, what are the gaps if we brought, we brought to them what we had gleaned thus far. So the design guidelines aren't finished yet, but we have enough information to say, here's what we wanna have at every campus so that you have equity. So where are the gaps on your campus? What are you missing? What do you not have? And so this is, um, what we have gleaned so far out of those workshops, both with the educators and then with each campus, um, there's definitely patterns that emerge in the district and those are on the left. I won't go through all of them, but just a few of them like admin needs to be more welcoming and supporting families. So then what's the design strategy for that? Let's call it a welcome center now instead of just admin. And let's put all those programs that are kind of shoehorned into portables and different spaces and give them spaces that are very intentional, like um, a space, a parent resource center, or some campuses already have a family resource center, and maybe that could be in there too. Um, a, a community hub that can be used for parent university and different things. And the welcome center can be different at different campuses, but we have kind of the ingredients of what could be in a welcome center to really reimagine the admin to be a very welcoming uh, place for families. Um, Another one is intentional space for student support services. So that could be adjacent or even part of the welcome center, a wellness center and a learning center for um, academic support and uh, any other kind of support that students need. Um, I'll jump to age appropriate learning environments. So that will come into play in the ed specs. You won't see that um, things about furniture and technology and the drawings when you come to the town hall, that'll be living inside of the ed specs document. Um, but things like play areas and all the site design will show how we create those different zones um, to make age appropriate learning environments. Uh, like I said, what, what we got most out of the student workshops uh, was the, the middle schooler needs that we really need to tailor things for them. So there's some um, other ingredients like they need locker rooms that work well and they need gyms and they need places to connect and play, especially um, at lunchtime. A lot of, a lot of times um, these days, middle schoolers are just like on their phones and screens. And so we, we wanna give them what they need um, besides a soccer field, but things that help them connect to each other and play with each other. Um, elevating the student dining experience. 
So um, maybe instead of calling those cafeterias, call it a cafe because you think of more of like a place where you would go out to eat, where you have some different options and different uh, types of seating, variety, nice colors and graphics um, and more space so that the district could have longer lunch periods. So they have more time to eat and connect with each other in just a very fun, child-friendly environment. Um, Reimagining the library. So we know a lot of those, um, they're really not being used. We don't have the staff at the moment, but if this is a plan for the future, uh, reimagining those spaces as a media resource center. And there's lots of ideas that came of what we could do in there, including um, using it for reading again. So currently we have satellite um, libraries and then it's a book cart with books in every classroom and that's great. So it's right there. Uh, but teachers are really wanting to also use that space again for reading. Um, and then the last one I'll mention is just a shared resource space for specialized programs. So we found, you know, one campus might have a STEAM lab or an innovation lab and something else, but across the board, there's really a lack of dedicated space for, for arts and after school programs and enrichment. So we, we have, um, some solutions like a flex lab that could be used to do all those things. So that way, when you build something new, you make sure that it's being used all day and after school. Uh, next slide. So again, this is the cover of a report, which you can find at the end of this PDF, all the links to all the reports. Um, we're in the thick of finalizing um, the draft. So here's uh, some excerpts from an example one at Renaissance at Matson. So we ask a different set of questions at those. Those are pretty much the same questions at every campus because it's about the campus, not a specific topic. Um, so we have a lot of questions um, related to um, the overall impression of the campus, both uh, the staff and the community outside of the campus. We ask about traffic patterns, um, safety and security, how are outdoor areas being used? Are they being optimized? Are there some opportunities there? We ask about the play areas and um, we ask about assembly. We find that a lot of these schools in California, they were designed for larger populations and, um, or sorry, smaller populations. And so they don't have spaces where the whole school can get together. Um, and a lot of the spaces, even for smaller groupings are just not enough. So we get a lot out of asking that question about assembly spaces indoors and outdoors. Um, and then we ask about more the things that we saw from the educators, Media Resource Center and other spaces like Makerspace and STEAM Labs and spaces for art and science and after school. Um, we ask about PE and athletics, are those being supported? And then we um, ask them to take all those notes that we've scribed and reflect quickly and think if, if you had to, uh, prioritize some things, what are your most immediate concerns? And then they pull out of those lists for the other eight questions and they come out with their, their um, immediate concerns. The next slide. So these are just uh, the reports that um, are done, just show some photos that we took of different things to um, support what the words are saying. Um, so in this one is just, yeah, you can go through these pretty quickly. Um, Yep, and then here's an example of traffic patterns. So we just document where are the problems, safety and security, uh, what needs to be done to uh, make the campuses even safer, uh, make it easy for site supervision. And then there's a set of a couple diagrams for each campus. And these are the ones that we'll bring to the town hall that just very succinctly show from the outside in and the inside out um, outside in meaning everything that's on the site and arriving to the site. What um, do we need to be aware of when we're designing these new master plans? So here it's about the congestion. We need higher fencing. Um, we need more lighting and the roof um, needs to be updated in one area. Next slide. And then this one's more about outside in. There's a lot of um, potential for using the field that isn't being used right now, um, adding shading and seating. And, an, and then we ask also if there's anything that's sacrosanct, like there's a Zen garden on this campus that we wanna um, 
preserve and make even better. Next slide. So inside out simply means just the build, we're looking from the inside of the buildings out, more focused on the interior. So for admin, um, saying it's not, it's not welcoming enough, we wanna make it more welcoming. Um, students have to exit the campus and then come back in through the front door. So there's something to rework there. Um, gathering spaces are lacking and we need uh, better school uh, spaces for after school programs and specialized programs. And then inside out, um, we need uh, better resources like flexible furniture and more fluid technology um, so that we can support students learning in different styles at the same time in the same zone. Um, and then locker rooms need updating on this campus. There's some um, details of the gym that need to be edited and more staff restrooms are needed due to the, the long distances that need to travel and the short break times. Next slide. So then from all of that, um, and we'll bring this to at the, at the town hall. So when we have the town hall, we're gonna give a, a little brief 20 minute kickoff about the vision and show some inspiring images like I showed earlier. And then everybody will break out and just go to the different stations for the different campuses. So we're having uh, three town halls organized by middle school attendance area, the schools that feed into it. So it'll be mul multiple schools. So um, at the station, there'll be the drawing of the new design proposed with the outside in, inside out diagrams. And then this list that shows um, what are the key goals for this campus. So they'll understand why we've done the design that we have and they can give uh, their input. All right, back to me. So. It, th at the end of the day, um, all of the proposed solutions, you know, filling that gap from the existing condition to bringing that campus up to meeting the district's vision of educational delivery translated to facilities, um, there's going to be, you know, uh, and once that gets uh, going through the cost estimate, there's going to be a price uh, associated with that. And in order to implement the projects within this plan, um, it's going to be approached strategically um, because you won't be able to, to fund the entire thing in one go. Um, so we'll look towards data uh, to drive these decisions in prioritizing projects and also how the master or the, excuse me, the sites are, uh, are planned in the first place, um, the capacities for the sites and working with your existing demographics, demographic projection for the 2027-2028 school year. Um, so any decision made really using data as that driver. And we'll come back to these um, drivers of social, social justice uh, that was set at the very onset of this project at our kickoff with um, district leadership. So again, at the very top bullet, using data to make those well-informed decisions for project prioritization and site plan approach. We're supporting the communities and families um, of Alum Rock and engaging them throughout the process. We're rolling in um, teacher and staff workforce housing, so supporting the teachers and staff within the district. Um, we all know the, the cost of housing in the areas can be um, a deterrent to maintain good staff and teachers, so uh, Alem Rock is recognizing this and offering uh, this workforce housing component rolled into this long-range strategic plan. Um, and supporting the cognitive development of all learners so that all learners can thrive in this environment, no matter where you're coming from, um, the baggage that you're, you're bringing with you um, into your school day. The schools should be supporting you as you're, uh, throughout your educational journey. That we're supporting the connections between children and adults, positive connections so that children have a safe place to go, not only the environment, but the, the people that they're around. Um, improving how we support our middle schoolers. <laughs> you know, recognizing athletics is a very strong component to a middle school. So how are these facilities supporting that middle schooler's journey as they prepare? Um, for high school. Um, we're engaging the community for culturally responsive decision-making um, and holding ourselves in the district accountable for executing the projects um, as we roll out through phases. And that ties back to project prioritization um, and having professional development for successful implementation. We can have these great 
uh, facilities that indicate all of these shifts in the way school is being taught. Um, but the teachers need to be brought on board with this as, this as well through strong professional development so that they know how to use this engaging furniture, how to use the um, technology. So just continuing to implement that through professional development. So using equity as our overarching goal, um, we're, we're using uh, strategic uh, specific data points as we uh, approach our site ratings analysis. Um, we have this as a question here because we use this to engage with our, um, our facilities planning group um, earlier, but we're looking at um, the age of the, or excuse me, the condition of the facilities, as well as the people who inhabit your school facilities. Um, so I mentioned earlier when I went through the facility condition assessments, we've got that data, the age of the facilities, the immediate concerns, um, identified items related to safety and security through those facility condition assessments. These we can quantify because there are dollar values attached to them or age. Um, and so we can wrap that into a site ratings analysis. And then we'll also roll in again that human component, your student body and your vulnerable populations so that as we talk about equity and making decisions based on equity, we're making decisions um, using a site rating system that rolls in the percentage of your student population who are socioeconomically disadvantaged at each campus, who are English learners and those newcomers to the district, your foster youth populations, homeless populations, and your special education students. So making sure that every student thrives. The site rating system will look something like this. I'm actually, these are a little bit reverse order, so I'll go to this one first. This is another sample, again, taking from another district, but it is an example of how we use that site rating system. So we did a similar analysis with Woodland Joint Unified School District. Um, you see the uh, vulnerable population statistics here. This is looking at the entire district uh, schools district-wide. We see um, up at the top, they went with a numbering system, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, one being kind of your A grade campuses, five being your F grade campuses. Um, and we can see the, the differences from campus to campus when we look at those factors I mentioned earlier, the condition of the facility, age of the facility, and your vulnerable populations. So now when we think about prioritizing projects, you can start to see which campuses may need the most help and improvement from an equity lens. So that, and I'll just mention these two slides that I'm kind of toggling back and forth between. This is an online tool, Power BI. Um, it's an app that we create um, and we can manipulate it, organize it in different ways, um, but you can set filters to it. So in this case, this is that site ratings analysis being combined with the cost estimate. So we see, you know, there's an expanded portion at the bottom that is not being shown right now, but we can see the entire cost estimate organized by site rating category. Um, so that as, again, as we approach prioritization later on in the process, um, we can we can pick and choose which category of sites or which specific site, if you wanted to target a specific one, but which sites would be prioritized and which category of project would be prioritized. So um, it's a very powerful tool. We know not every project will be able to be uh, funded initially. So we have a running total of the cost in the corner. As you select projects, you can see kind of where we're hitting. Um, this will help set up a kind of, we call it priority one project list um, that will be designed to uh, remain within the structure of existing funding. And then we can set a a kind of priority level two project list. When additional funding is able to be achieved, these will be your next projects. And a powerful uh, tool that this Power BI affords us is at the bottom left, you see this escalation years. So that next round of funding, well, let's see, we have an idea of when this these projects may be able to be rolled out. So let's apply an escalation to that year so that we have a more realistic number that we're working with and that the district needs to set aside to be able to implement these projects or at least plan for. Let's see. 
All right. And now, Russell, I'll be passing it over to you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit tonight about uh, our scope of work related to the Energy Master Plan, um, and then and then discuss uh, how that fits in with the broader um, uh, master planning exercise. So, as you all recall, we were brought on board to uh, develop uh, an energy plan district wide, and the the kinds of things we'll be covering include energy efficiency, renewable energy, and storage projects. Um, we run a, a process that's pretty data driven and data intensive and starts with a lot of data collection and benchmarking of all your facilities. And we've done that already um, from the utility perspective. Um, the second thing we do is, is a phase of project identification, which uh, comes from the, the data analysis, as well as um, some degree of auditing and the, the opportunity we have here. Uh, at Alum Rock is to coordinate that effort with the work going on in the master plan. And we don't often get to do that. And, and there's a real benefit in that um, much of what we need to understand about the sites is already being uh, discovered and documented for us. So in an ideal world, we'd sort of trail along uh, a little bit behind the master planning effort uh, and then fold our effort into it uh, as as the master plan is coming together. Uh, the other two important aspects of, of what we're gonna be doing for the district is developing a, uh, a series of models to uh, estimate the costs and savings related to the energy component of the program. Energy projects are um, kind of neat in the sense that if they are structured correctly and implemented right, um, they can actually save the district uh, money over time, in addition to the environmental benefits that the district would see from those projects. So it's always a goal of the effort to make sure that um, the paybacks from those energy savings projects or renewable generation projects are reasonable um, and, and result in, in um, revenue to the, to the district's general fund. And then the last thing with the, that we're going to be doing is implementation planning. We'll be talking about um, how to phase projects, and, and in particular, how to fold that into um, the implementation elements of, of your master plan. Next slide, please. Um, so, so the key inputs to what we're doing are making sure we're aligned with energy and environmental goals um, of, of the district and, and your priorities as we go forward. Um, we are going to be looking at decarbonization opportunities, which is a little bit different than just strict energy savings. Uh, if you look at uh, a portfolio of projects that's put together with the idea of maximizing carbon reductions, that's a little bit different a thing than maximizing energy savings. And so you can think about it uh, as an example in terms of swapping out existing uh, HVAC equipment and gas-fired space heaters with uh, electrified heat pumps. Um, those can be more expensive. They can be a little bit more complicated to implement. Um, and what you're doing in effect is switching fuels from natural gas to electricity. And so, and so it's not strictly a savings project. Um, and so that can be a, a little more subtle and a little more sophisticated the way that we would model that and, and, and even implement it uh, in terms of how that might be coordinated with um, uh, rehabilitation or modernization of existing facilities. Uh, as I mentioned before, our, our, our scope will include um, some significant financial analysis, and that will be built on, on different sets of scenarios where we'll look at options of different measures or groups of measures, um, even looking at different assumptions around costs and savings, depending on what's going on with the utilities and implementation timing. And then we'll also quantify um, the environmental impacts, most notably in terms of uh, greenhouse gas savings. Um, and then lastly, uh, the implementation planning is going to be an interesting component of this project as well, because there is a real opportunity to um, look at different implementation pathways, one of which would certainly include integration into your master planning exercise and sort of long term and even medium term plans for new facilities and, and facility modernization, along with standalone uh, energy initiatives. Um, so oftentimes when we work with school districts, there's still a lot of uh, infrastructure at the school that won't necessarily be 
touched in a major way um, through a through a bond measure or a master planning exercise. And so it may make sense for some measures or some groups of measures to uh, implement those as standalone uh, district wide kinds of projects. And that'll have implications on contracting and procurement. Next slide. So I'll just finish up with a word on solar. Um, as many of you may have heard, net energy metering policy changed in December of last year, and it has imposed some deadlines on us to move forward with solar projects in order to maximize the savings that the district would achieve from those projects. Uh, the deadline essentially is April 14th of this year, uh, and the action that needs to be taken is submitting a series of what they call interconnection applications with your utility PG&E. Um, we, when we first came on board, were hoping that we could move quickly enough to maybe run a procurement and have a solar vendor in position in time to do that. But with the CPUC decision, that doesn't look like it's going to be possible. And so we want to make sure that those interconnection applications get submitted so that you have sort of maximum flexibility and maximum savings should you um, choose ultimately to, to install solar around the district. So I wanted to let you know that that sort of came out of the process I was talking about before, and it's sort of been fast tracked on its own its own pathway. Um, if we do get the interconnection applications in, one real benefit of that is we can slow down a little bit on the procurement and implementation of the solar system to make sure we're working with LPA and coordinating with that larger effort you've been hearing so much about um, to make sure that the the systems are sited in the right places. And so. If, if we get those applications in, it'll essentially buy us three years to figure out um, how to do this, how to bring a vendor on board and, and to get them built. I believe, oh, there's just one more slide. I'm not gonna cover all this. I'm certainly happy to answer questions about it, but there, there are a whole host of siting considerations related to solar projects. They're on the slide here. The bottom line is that it's very difficult to put solar on existing roofs. It's a little easier with new roofs, but it, but you really, our recommendation is to bundle the solar component of the project into the rest of the building construction. When you do that, as much as we love the concept of solar ready, if you build a new building that's solar ready and then try to do solar on it a year or two later, um, it creates a, a series of challenges. So um, that's kind of the main thing. We avoid cutting down trees. You have to stay at least 20 feet away from existing buildings. And so if you've driven around neighboring communities, well, and very local to the district office, right? There, there is a school site um, where you see those elevated carport structures. And so that's kind of the default assumption about how you do solar in a cost-effective way in a school setting. Benefit is you get a lot of shade out of that too. So um, anyway, I won't dwell any more on that, but there, there are a lot of um, sort of trade-offs in those considerations. And, and again, it's a kind of a unique opportunity here to be partnering with LPA. Um, to make progress on that uh, as, as the master planning exercises unfold. So that's all I had. Thank you very much. Great. So I just wanted to share uh, what our next steps are. We're going to promote the town hall meetings. Um, there will be three campus groupings, as I mentioned. So um, there, we'll, we'll share in a bit uh, a flyer of that we're making that we've made for each campus will be translated um we'll have um, a steering committee meeting to discuss the capacity study data and where we are in that analysis um we'll we are working with arc right now on incorporating the solar layouts so in fact uh today we were working on site design and looking at those and overlaying them and see how how that's working with uh, what we've gleaned from all of our deep engagement and then the week of the 13th, we'll be rolling out the community surveys in class and teacher professional development meetings and through the district website. And this is just to show you uh, the flyers we've made. So we have a digital version and a print version. So the district will be um, blasting these out and printing some and putting them around. Um, and the closer we get to it, we'll ramp that up to make sure we have a really high engagement that's really important to get the community to be involved in these. We, we really need to hear everyone's voice um, to make um, this master plan equitable. And for our facility master plan committee, we've completed two 
And we have our next one, March 16th. So that's where we're gonna share the demographic trends, the capacity studies analysis review. And we would have already done the town hall for the first group of schools. So we'll do a debrief on that. And then um, the next meetings, we just keep giving updates on the process um, until we get to, um, like I said, where the rubber hits the road, we need to prioritize which projects need to be done first, uh, the ones that will have um, the most impact. So that's uh, what we have as our update on what we've done that we wanted to share with you. Uh, does anybody have any questions or, or comments? Great. Well, hang on. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, before I move open it to the board, I'm going to open item 3.02 for, uh, for public comment. Uh, is there any public comment on item 3.02? Board President, there are currently no public comment. Actually, sorry, there is a Mr. Ed. Ed, please unmute yourself. The moment you begin speaking, the timer will begin. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Eddie from Adelante. I just want to understand, I believe that uh, there was supposed to have been some type of information gathering session uh, to be held at Adelante in the fall and it was uh, postponed and that it was supposed to happen later on to get uh, parent input on site. Is that still happening? I'm um, just looking for clarification because it's one of the uh, middle schools who um, needs a lot of attention. Thank you. So Andrea, that's one that was on your list. I believe that was scheduled for December and it was done in January, right? Yes, we did have that site meeting. Um, those, if, if I may respond to the public comment, um, those, um, the first round of, of you, you can't, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> I thought, what is it, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, can't directly respond to the uh, public on that one, but uh, if a board member would like to ask it, we can respond. But, but if a board member, yes. So uh, is there any um, but uh, is there any further public comment? Board President, there is currently no more further public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, questions or comments by members of the board, Vice President Herrera Loera. Thank you, Board President. Uh, and um, that was a part of my question. So um, yeah, I guess we'll, I'll ask all of my questions and then just go through, um, I think it's actually one for each of you to respond to. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with uh, the question in regards to Adelante, if you can clarify that. Um, and then I also have a question, Andrea, and I think that's for you. In regards to, I know you showed us a list of the grading um, and you showed us an example of, of another district and their total schools and the different grades. Um, I guess just to understand in the timeline, would we as a board get that at some point and where more or less, you know, because I know things shift for different reasons, where more or less would we see a list like that? Um, and then Mariana in regards to, and I think this has to do also with the Adelante, um, you know, I sit here as a also a parent of a of a middle schooler, right? Where she's like, "Mom, I you know I wish I had my locker," or you know, mm -hmm. and things like that, right? And other needs. Um, so, in regards to um, recommendations, such as right, because I think of some of our schools that might be K through eight, maybe that should have never been, or you know, and and I'm not saying that that's what we have. I'm just saying that that might be something that comes up as you all uh, continue to look at our schools and provide feedback, is that something that you would come to us as well, you know, as uh, somebody that are looking at our schools as experts and how to best use, right, all of our, all of our schools to the best abilities for our children, staff, um, and communities? Um, and would that be a part of that uh, report back? And then in regards to the strategic uh, plan that you mentioned, um, is that something that, and just to clarify, we will receive on October 23rd with kind of something that we would pass as a board, but also would it be kind of like, this is our next steps based on all the um, information that you've gathered. And sorry to 
I just want to put it out there so that you all know where I'm thinking and some of my questions as we're going. Um, and then the last but not least for Russell in regards to the energy efficient, um, the solar power, um, is there an action that that we would do today? And is that where is this right now where we would take action, where we would make a recommendation? Because I'm thinking the April deadline, um, which I more or less kind of heard about in the last month. So I'm glad you're bringing it to us. Um, do we need to take action, whether it's today's meeting or next meeting, in order to um, benefit from some of those um, cost and savings that you talked about? So hopefully you didn't get confused and I'm here to clarify or uh, make my questions more clear. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was good. I, I, it's a four part question. Took notes. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, as far as the site ratings. Uh, we are working on translating. The reports are like 100 pages, so we have to make that jump to make it nice and easy for it to be digested by a layperson. So those will be um, part of the town hall. We'll, we'll bring those. And you're going to see um, a bar chart like Andrea was showing that shows every campus what grade it got. So we're always thinking holistically about the district. But then in each campus report, it'll show for that campus the six categories to show the math of why it gets the grade that it gets. Um, so yes, at our next board meeting, you'll definitely have that in, in your package. Um, and then your comment about K-8 versus middle school and just like helping the middle schoolers, that is baked into our design guidelines, which are what's driving um, the site plans for each um, campus. So there are definitely things that we have in there that are going to help with um, helping the middle schoolers. It's a you know the most awkward um, time of transition um, in childhood, like have what they need, um, especially where we're seeing those gaps and we heard from them directly what they wish they had. So that'll be both in the design guidelines, the ed specs, and in the campuses. Um, and as far as uh, our strategic plan, so. Um, that will be done by October, 2023, but we'll be meeting with the board again. I believe we have two more meetings. Uh, one of them will be a special board workshop where we're gonna do that project uh, prioritization exercise with you after we do it th with the facility master plan committee. So that will be in person and we'll bring the tools that you need and all the information on the data and dashboards. It's like really easy to understand. Um, so that you can use that data to make a well-informed decision about which projects now that we have pricing, what it would cost, like which are the ones that need to go first um, once we establish um, what is the budget, what should the budget be for like the first round of projects. And Andrea, if you want to add anything. Oh, I was just going to say we did meet with Adelante. So while that one was postponed, that was completed as part of our campus visioning workshops. So that will be complete um, as we wrap up those reports that will be included. And I think, Russell, you're part four. Yes. And in, in reference to the solar, um, that that's uh, I, I should have pointed that out more directly before. There is an item uh, later on in your agenda under the action item section to authorize a budget for ARC to develop and, and submit those interconnection applications, which, which was not part of the uh, original plan um, when our contract was awarded last time. So yes, that is an important action that the deadline is, is real and uh, we, we would be able to, uh, to get those applications in by the deadline and make sure that uh, that, that is secure for the district. Thank you. Okay, uh, for questions or comments by members of the board. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the, like it, but thank you for the uh, very thorough report um, to everybody on the team. And uh, my question is a couple questions specifically um, to Mr. Driver with regards to solar. Um, Trustee Herrera Loera already covered one of them, but one of my questions is, um, if indeed the action passes later in the agenda, how, what does that say, or or does it say anything about the district's kind of, uh, what's, how do I, firm commitment to kind of firmly move forward in this process? I know we're, we've been moving in this direction, we're exploring, we're looking at alternatives, but if and when this action does get approved, 
does that increase indeed the level of commitment to moving forward with this or is it just kind of procedural to make sure we meet those deadlines? Um, I mean, it represents, I, I think, a commitment um, fr from that perspective. It doesn't obligate the district to do anything. I just wanted to make that distinction. But, um, you know, your district is not alone in racing towards this deadline. And so a lot of districts are confronting the same kind of decision point where they're having to commit a little bit earlier you know, some resource to get that the, the, the current net energy metering secured than they otherwise would have. Um, and, and so it is a little bit of a commitment, clearly, from a, from a budget point of view. Um, but, but, you know, the payback in terms of additional savings is many times what it's going to take for us to get those NEM applications together. Um, but just to be clear, it does not mean you have to implement solar if market conditions change or something happens or the facilities master planning exercise suggests a different approach, um, you, you can always do it differently later, but the cost to the district will be some loss of the savings um, that you would have otherwise secured under the current policy. Okay. Does, that, that, does that answer the question? A quick follow-up, I'm sorry. What was, a, a quick follow-up to what you just said, Mr. Driver. Um, the I think I heard you say something about savings and the, the savings that we will get. Are, are we at a point now where we've determined that moving forward in this way would indeed result in some level of savings? Obviously, it would vary depending on, you know, site locations and structure types, all that kind of stuff, pay, you know, how we pay for it, how we structure all of the financial parts. But are we at a point where we've determined that this would be beneficial financially for the district? Our analysis on that front is not complete. It, it's our assumption going into it that the answer will be yes, because it is for all the other clients that we work with. Um, but as you correctly point out, the degree of those savings or whether you find savings at all will come down at least in part to how the solar is implemented um, and how that affects the cost structure, essentially. But you know, we, we will lay out those options for you and we'll be working with LPA on, on some of those siting issues, which drive costs a little bit. But if you take the assumption that you would do a district-wide solar deployment at that kind of scale, um, we're seeing the costs come in in other procurements that we're running right now um, that would certainly result in savings for the district. But I can't be more specific than that because we haven't finished the sizing of the systems and done the the sort of production simulation on what those systems would generate and the economic analysis around it. That would be one of our next steps. Okay, thank you. And then based on um, you know some of the demographic information that we've received recently and trends that we've been following for a while now, um, you know, obviously, along with many, many, many other districts, our um, student population continues to be an issue for the district in terms of just managing sites and resources. And in my estimation, it, the reality of the closure of schools still is a reality, a potential reality for the district going forward. And so if and when that does indeed occur, is that possibility factored into the planning that we may you know, plan for something, but then that site may end up being you know, closed as a, as a, um, a school site. So is that kind of factored into how we're planning this? Yes, as we were doing our capacity analysis and working with the districts uh, as they've been, you know, we're working very closely with folks like Colvera and other district leaders. Um, we're getting those ideal operating capacities from them and running our just site planning capacity analysis, um, trying to gain the most efficiency for the district, um, but also staying mindful to unique programs or locations of schools, opportunities um, for you know, the students within your district. So that is all part of the conversation, yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, think, I, I appreciate your mindfulness with that. I think that is, according to what I've, uh, information that I've received, that it will be a reality that this board will need to confront this district. And, and it's important that you are being mindful of that as we move forward in the process. 
Um, you know, I, just so I don't have to say that the next item, I'll also be supportive of the action with regards to the solar later in the agenda. Um, you know, as I've mentioned before, we've come a long way. Um, and we, you know, it's my only regret in this whole process is that, you know, we, I would have wished we would have started earlier because we'd be like a year, year and a half ahead and closer to potential savings. But that being said, I'm glad that we are here now. Um, and I'm glad that this team is here helping us to get to where we want to be as a district. So thank you everyone uh, for continuing to move forward with this. And I look forward to um, what's to come for us. Thank you. Further questions or further questions or comments by members of the board. Uh, seeing that, I'll just wrap up. I I thank uh, LPA and ARC alternatives for uh, presenting to us tonight. I appreciate uh, the detail uh, as well as the uh, layout of the future of what's uh, to come with our facilities master planning process. Uh, on that note, I want to encourage. Uh, all our families to to uh, attend these forums. Uh, this is an opportunity to have your your uh, a say in the future of our district, the future of our schools. Uh, you know, this is an exciting moment in time. Uh, you know, well, what is it they say? Uh, you know, our educational needs are changing, and this is an opportunity for us to. Uh, reimagine our our school sites in you know in uh, in uh, over third you know in some cases three generations. So again, thank you so much for the presentation, and I look forward to uh, the deliberations to come. And uh, hopefully, we you know we begin the process of renewing our sites for the uh, next generation of kids. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much. So with that, we move on to section four, comments and communications. Uh, I am 4.01, Alum Rock Administrators Association. Okay, yes, okay. Uh, Jesus, you are recognized. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Perfect, thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. Bauer, ARUSD staff, and the Alamar community. My name is Jesus Araujo, and I am here this evening representing ARAA. Um, it is a privilege to speak to you tonight to represent a group of vibrant educators and administrators who work tremendously hard in service to our schools and community. Um, there's exciting developments taking place across ARUSD and our administrators continue to work to serve their prospective sites and departments. So I'm going to provide a few updates of the amazing things happening across the district. Uh, Russo McEntee Academy had an exciting January. Um, students are diving into birds and insect units. Science from scientists work with students in separating physical matter expanding the student's knowledge base on concepts of recycling and reusing materials. Our fourth and fifth grade students enjoyed participating in class and school spelling bee. Next week, our third grade students, teachers and parent chaperones will be heading to Henry Cowell State Park. At Ryan Steam Academy, uh, we started building our new steam lab in partnership with RAF. All students had the opportunity to build and be part of this experience. We held our spelling bee and are ready for district spelling bee. We continue to serve our students and the entire community with the research partnership with Loaves and Fishes. We plan to distribute about 200 cooked meals to our community members every Tuesday. San Antonio, we had our, our school site sp spelling bee. It ran very smoothly. We're ready for LPAC testing this week. We had our first week of Los Dichos last week. All parent volunteers were wonderful. Students and teachers really loved having Los Dichos come, come into their classrooms and read books and do activities with them. At Renaissance Academy, um, Renaissance Academy at Fisher is most appreciative of their partnership with Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative, BALSI. Um, 
has partnered with our physical education teachers and has run programming aimed to engaging and inspiring female students' participation in sports. The number of female students engaging in athletic activities has noticeably increased thanks to the collaboration between the BOSSE staff, our PE teachers, and our after-school athletics program coaches. At Adelante, at Adelante One, we have been busy at Adelante hosting wonderful educational opportunities such as behavior assemblies, having a happy hallow do assembly with our first graders, RAF stopping by uh, to do hands-on activities with our students and celebrating a wonderful mid-year parent volunteer breakfast. From the department side, we had a successful VAPA winter showcase on January 26 that highlighted the art and music performances from our VAPA cluster, Puritan Elementary, Linda Elementary, Linda Vista Elementary, and George Middle School. We are preparing for our, our spring showcase as well. The March Madness Tournament with the middle schools in the district will be held at James Lake High School from on March 3rd through March 5th. The summer LPAC testing window is now open for our English learners across the district. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Uh, item 4.02, Teamsters. I'm not sure that they're gonna have somebody tonight. Okay. Uh, um, that's like no one from Teamsters. Uh, moving on, 4.03, California School Employees Association. Sharon wanted to connect, but she was having connectivity issues. I don't know if she's on the, on, in the audience. Uh, Carlos or Luis, is uh, Sharon in the audience? No, we don't see Sharon. Okay. Okay. She sends her regards. Okay, very well. Uh, 4.04, Alum Rock Educators Association. Uh, Jocelyn, I see you. Jocelyn, you have the floor. Hello, uh, Jocelyn, you have the floor. Jocelyn, you are recognized. Uh, can you hear us? Oh, oh okay. Oh. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. I, I Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, because it, I didn't get the typical little unmute yourself thing. Anyway, good evening. Um, good evening, board president, fam, trustees, and the Alum Rock community. I would like to start out by expressing my sincere gratitude to board president, fam, and board clerk, Quintero, for attending the CTA school board dinner last week with myself and Sandra Rivera, our area vice president. It was a great and long overdue in-person event that was well attended by many school board trustees throughout the county. One of the realizations that I remember from that evening was the number of CTA members and teachers who are increasing their commitment to education by serving as school board members as well. It's exciting to see the value they bring as an educator to the decision-making level. In fact, the two CTA board of directors from our region who attended and spoke at the event are not only classroom teachers themselves, but also serve on the school boards in the districts with where they reside. Thank you again for taking the time from your busy schedules and families to share in some candid conversation and an enjoyable evening. With the month of February being recognized as Black History Month, I would like this school board and district administration to reflect back to July 2020, when area brought forth a Black Lives Matter at school resolution, 
that was um, mentioned earlier in the evening by several of our area members and um, Equity and Human Rights Committee. Um, the Black Lives Matter at School resolution was approved by the then board majority and by the, the current seated trustees, Quintero, Herrera Loera, and Bejarano. Trustee Chavez was present at that meeting. However, she was absent when the vote was taken to approve the resolution. One part of that resolution that was passed was that ARUSD committed to hiring and retaining Black educators and administrators district-wide. However, the Area Equity and Human Rights Committee has witnessed a decline in the number of Black, black educators within the district, some due to retirement, some have left for higher paying districts. However, others have left as a result of racist remarks and actions that they have been subjected to in the workplace. I am asking in support of the Area Human Rights and Equity Committee that a purposeful and intentional diligent effort be made to recruit and retain qualified black educators and administrators to the Allen Rock School District. Our students deserve it, our educators deserve it, and our community deserves it. Moving on to the next topic of major importance in our district is the, the desperate immediate need for help, support, and guidance for our educators in dealing with the most important issue that is prohibiting our teachers from from providing the best educational program for all students. And that is the extreme unacceptable behavior by particular students across all grade levels and across our campuses. I am daily receiving desperate pleas from teachers asking what rights they have when they are attacked, literally hit, kicked, punched, bit, and have had furniture and sharp objects thrown at them. They have received threats of physical violence from both students and parents, leaving them scared and helpless. Aside from doing an in-school class suspension, as outlined in the California Ed Code, or filling out endless amounts of paperwork to initiate an SST process, which may take weeks and months to complete, or notifying the police if the threat rises to that level, exactly what rights and resources does a teacher have to defend and protect the safety of the other students as well as themselves in the classroom? Where do we turn? Who has our backs? And what guidelines, steps, and processes does the district have in place to address this? This used to happen only on occasion. It was the exception, but that has now changed. It is happening consistently and frequently, and it is also a cause of educators leaving the profession. This is my desperate plea to you, the administration and the school board, to please provide our educators with the necessary skills and resources needed now more than ever to help us deal with this situation. Lastly, I would like to address an item you all must deal with tonight, and that's the issue of non reelects of our probationary teachers. I sent an email to you last week expressing my shock that this was being dealt with a month earlier than any other school year in the past. As you may or may not know, the California Ed Code allows the district to non-reelect a teacher on probationary status up until March 15th of their second year, and this may be done without giving a reason or cause. However, through the years that I have been area president, I have had many conversations with the various superintendents and assistant superintendents of HR that taking such action should not be arbitrary. In other words, it shouldn't be simply because one administrator didn't like something that was said to them one day by a teacher. So they decided to exercise their power and let them go. I think the typical standards were, standard words that have been used are, you're not a good fit, which means absolutely nothing. 
to someone who has put in years of college to explore their passion of teaching and receives glowing evaluations from their current administrators and much praise from their students and parents, only to be blindsided by receiving a letter saying, you are being non reelected for no cause. Oh yeah, and by the way, you can make that choice to resign, however you need to do so within the next 15 hours if you want, but you must still carry out your duties for the next four and a half months with a positive attitude. That is not what the intent of that ed code is. No one should be blindsided by such action, especially if they receive no support or guidance from their administrator to improve those first few months on the job. I don't deny that there are certain situations where taking such extreme action may be justified. However, this year, there were very few cases where it was. I feel a lot of empathy for those who have been done a disservice. However, I know in the big picture, other districts will profit from our losses and those teachers will be appreciated at their next stop along the way. It does make me very sad though that Alan Rock is letting some really valuable <laughs> educators get away. In fact, Area just recently surveyed our members to get feedback on what it will take for them to stay in Alum Rock and the results were really disheartening to what the future holds for this district. To sum up that topic, please don't ever take such action of non-reelecting educators without first looking at substantial justifiable support to back it up. And don't take that action so early in the school year. It just isn't necessary. It serves no positive purpose and it adds an extra month of lower morale. Think about that when you go into closed session tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, item 4.05, Superintendent Bauer. Thank you, Board President. I want to thank Andrea V and Scarlett Tripodi. Uh, these are two students from Linda Vista who sent me a very sweet message that I was not expecting in, in a very appropriate manner. And so Andrea B, uh, fourth grader in Linda Vista and Scarlett Tripodi, fifth grader in Linda Vista, thank you very much for your note that I was not expecting and it was a, a real um, joy in my day um, a few days ago. I want to wish everybody a happy Black History Month. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Talton for reaching out to us and having a very candid, generous, and genuine conversation around some of the kinds of things that we need to improve. Um, one of them is certainly the way sometimes um, people talk around and use certain terms around the district. I, you know, we had, we talked about that and how sometimes our own culture music allows for certain words that are very inappropriate and cause a lot of pain to be just thrown around. And we are looking very um, formally around some solutions to really um, help our students and our staff to be very mindful about the way we talk to each other. I think that that also, carries out throughout the district and how we see each other and how we uh, talk to each other is very important. So thank you, Ms. Dalton, for bringing that to us personally. And uh, I really, we are really looking forward to hiring more black uh, administrators, staff members, and teachers in Alum Rock. I also want to highlight that March Madness begins on March 3rd. So I hope to see everybody there. It's a great opportunity for our students and our uh, parents and our staff to see our kids doing some wonderful um, things around our community. And I also um, want to thank the what I call the Spark Plus. We have a number of parents, in addition to the, the Spark parents going through uh, professional development for parents once a month with Project Cornerstone. We have about 40 parents 
joining us virtually in these lessons. I also want to uh, uh, highlight our after school program plus the some of the wonderful opportunities that now we're providing to our students in addition to tutoring and intervention. We now have culinary arts classes in arts uh, and creativity throughout the district. And I'm looking forward to a wonderful, another wonderful season of a spring camp. So Alam Rock, we have a lot of wonderful things coming our way. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh... So I'm 4.06, uh, communications and comments from members of the board. Okay, I see Trustee Bejarano. Yes, thank you, President Pam. Uh, first, I just wanted to start with, um, I don't know how much people have been paying attention to this particular thing recently, but it's been at the forefront of news and, and popular culture or whatever recently, which is kind of the, kind of an explosion of artificial intelligence, AI, um, specifically right now, chat GPT is a phrase you might have heard. And so because of the implications of that technology, um, you know, on all aspects of life, really, but particularly for in this case, for with regards to school districts and our school, I did um, submit to Dr. Bauer a resolution that I think she wisely um, said that we should take a look at. And look at it from an educator's perspective and, and really think it through. Um, but my position on it, just um, to get ahead of it a little bit, is that this is a technology some of you as educators or as parents might already be experiencing your children using it um, for whatever it may be, fun or, or schoolwork or whatever. And it this stuff is happening super fast. Like if, if you pay any attention at all, it's being integrated into like search engines and everything. And so my opinion that I would strongly encourage my colleagues if and when this resolution does come to the board um, would be to really consider the resolution to approve it because what it does is put some guidelines, some structure, some expectations around the, the proper ethical, legal, safe way to use chat GPT and AI, because it, although it is, it can be a challenge early in its kind of evolution here, there's a lot of opportunity, I believe, to use it as a tool for education, for a tool, especially for kids that don't have access to a lot of resources, like maybe some in our district, to be able to have access to a wealth of knowledge, perspectives, and, and different ways of learning. And if we're you know, going to say in our mission statement that we're preparing our students for a 21st century to be, comp you know, competitive in the 21st century, this is a skill set that I believe they absolutely need to have. So I think, you know, it's wise to take our time uh, with this kind of thing and make sure that we are thoughtful in it. But I do think that time is of the essence as well on the flip side of that. So I look forward to that um, coming forward. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say, just in terms of kind of climate of the district, I guess, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about solidarity tonight, and I too stand, stand in solidarity, in solidarity with our students and their families, all of them. I, I make absolutely no apologies for my stance that our students and families are who I serve as a board member, first and foremost. The desires of each one of us as board members or our district staff and even teachers, in my estimation, are secondary to what our students need. And, and I'm speaking, you know, as an individual board member right now, so I, my comments do not reflect necessarily those of the board. But in my opinion, I'm extremely disappointed that we have members of our Alamo community, teachers no less, who have specifically called out a minor and a former student publicly after they spoke their mind. I'm an advocate of empowering our youth, including those who spoke so eloquently tonight in support of one of our staff. I'm, I'm super impressed by those students. They, and I welcome and I encourage that kind of participation. Um, I find it inexcusable that a segment of adults, particularly educators, would actively seek to disempower our youth for simply for offending them personally. To me, that's an, a behavior that's inexcusable to, to di try to disempower our own Alan Rock youth. I would hope that educators are familiar with stages, stages of human development 
particularly youth development, as they might then be able to recognize that the actions taken by the youth that they've spoken out against are completely in line with what we'd be expected for a teenager. You know, courage and leadership is really about saying what you believe, even when you know that the possible consequences may be negative. Just as I commend those former students who voiced their opinions tonight in support of their teacher, I love that. But I also wholeheartedly commend the former student referred to in the comments made by some of our teachers just for speaking their mind, the student. There, I know there's gonna be some who say that I'm saying this because I, I know Trustee Quintero, which obviously I know all of my colleagues on the board, but regardless of who we're talking about here, me, Trustee Quintero, Trustee Chavez, whoever it may be, my position is the same with regard to prioritizing students, students' well-being, their families' well-being, above anyone on this board, above anyone in the administration, and even above teachers. At the end of the day, my service here is to students and families of Allen Rock, period. I make no apologies for that. My own daughters, in fact, spoke out against the district during their time as students here. And I would have been absolutely appalled if adults, teachers, had responded to my daughter's advocacy by seeking to silence them and diminish them as young women. Because that didn't happen, they're now able to navigate in the world as young women. And, you know, that I think that speaks to what we want out there as Allen Rock alumni, the ability for our students to have the confidence to know that they can go out into the world and bring the perspective of our community to those who may not be aware of, you know, what happens in communities like ours and the resources that we need, the opportunities that we need. Only those students who we empower to have a voice will be able to go out and make things better for the next generation. I've talked a lot about accountability recently in this district as a board member. My expectation is that board members, the superintendent and staff operate with professionalism and respect towards all members of our community, all members of our community. And my expectation is that every adult in the Allen Rock family keep the interest of all of our students in mind first and foremost, before their own personal opinions or perspectives. Something that I'm not sure is happening in some specific instances. In my mind, that's inexcusable. Again, going back to the thought that at the end of the day, I'm here to serve students. And, you know, I think those kinds of behaviors, when we're not doing that, whether it's me, I always I'll start with myself, whether it's me to anyone else in the district, when we are not demonstrating those behaviors of keeping the end goal in mind, success of our students above our own personal needs, wants, or desires, then I think it's gonna be challenging for us to get where we want to be as a district. But if we can, obviously we all have things that we want and we all need and realities of this world, this community, this you know financial reality, there's things that we all need and want. And those definitely should be part of a conversation, a respectful conversation from both sides, any side of the table. But I think at the end of the day, I guess what I'm getting to is that, um, Again, my personal opinion is that the expectation for any one of us as adults in this district should be the priority is our students, not our own personal needs, wants, or desires. Um, so those are my comments for tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Viharano. Uh, any other trustees with the questions or uh, comments? Uh, okay. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Thank you, Trustee Bejarano. You said it a lot more better than I was uh, thinking. Um, but with that, I'll follow up in that as a board member, I will always stand for the safety of our children, first and foremost. Um, so I'll just reiterate that and thank our uh, staff member, Norma Flores, who uh, sent out on Friday um, our mandating, ma mandating reporting um, policies. Um, highlighting what we go by as an entire district. Um, please, we have any questions, you know, whether you're a parent, a staff member, things aren't clear, you still might not understand it, or you, you know, there's a gray area, please make sure to ask. And if you don't get the um, question answered, go above, send us emails to ensure that we all understand what our um, mandating reporting um, states. 
And something I want to highlight is that the policy defines the standards um, and including the fact that all students should be treated with respect and dignity at all times, which means that even as adults, we might not agree with how they're behaving or what they're doing, um, which is one of the hardest things, you know, some of the roles that I've had as an adult in many children's lives in our community, it gets hard, I understand. Um, but ensuring that all of our children, regardless, regardless, are treated with respect and dignity at all times. Um, with that as well, um, you know, we thank each and every one of you for ensuring the safety and um, know that as a board member, I will do um, what's in my capacity um, to ensure this, uh, regardless of what, you know, somebody may or may not like, um, but that is my responsibility. Um, just in addition to what Trustee Bejarano mentioned earlier. And uh, moving on to fun things, I'm looking forward to visiting some of our schools. Hopefully I did talk to uh, our superintendent to um, get me on the calendar to visit some of the schools. Um, so looking forward to seeing you all uh, in the near future. And um, also very excited for um, the many activities and um, staff um, and advocacy in our district for the Black, Black History Month um, as an ally, you know, in supporting um, and knowing that there's always more to do. I look forward to the many more uh, uh, things and report backs and um, ways to improve our district. Um, so I look forward in having those conversations. Um, thank you for the, all the emails that I've received. Um, I've been reading them and, um, you know, I look forward. Thank you for being, uh, even if you don't have children in our district, um, for caring enough to take the time to send us uh, those messages. Um, and obviously being a part of a district that honors all children, as I mentioned, all ethnicities. Um, I also want to invite everybody to mark their calendars, March 10, 11, and 12, we'll be celebrating again um, the Aztec Mexican New Year at Emma Push Park here in our community, um, one of the largest uh, ceremonies for our indigenous um, nations. We start on Friday with Cali Native Night, uh, where the indigenous people of this land open up, um, and we will be having um, vendors and workshops and activities for the children, so I look forward to seeing you all. Uh, there. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Board President. Oh, okay. Uh, Trustee uh, Clerk Quintero, Trustee Chavez, any comments? Um, it's 8 o'clock. Okay. I have a full agenda. Oh. <laughs> reserve my comments, uh, so we can still dedicate the, the time that closed session is in. Okay. Uh, I'll just wrap up with, you know, a uh, busy, busy month. Uh, Yes, I, I do thank uh, Jocelyn for inviting me to the CTA board members dinner. Very, very nice dinner and got a chance to uh, meet with my counterpart board presidents uh, uh, in the room. Uh, all, you know, all these events are always a nice way to do uh, exchange diplomatic messages. Uh, but I want to focus on, you know, uh, I had the opportunity to open the Winter VAPA Showcase at George Middle School, uh, our first uh, VAPA Showcase since the pandemic. It was a, a wonderful two thumbs up performance. Uh, I also wanted to congratulate a, a painter at, for tabling at the Tet Festival at uh, Eastridge Mall. We had a great turnout. We signed up more than 60 interested parents uh, who are interested in our Vietnamese immersion dual language, I mean, Vietnamese language dual immersion program. And I, uh, you know, uh, we're growing, uh, painters growing to third grade, and I'm very, very thrilled at the, you know, for the future of painter and a special thanks to uh, Principal Manluco, his wife, and Mr. Pran for, uh, and Mr. Tin Fan for, uh, you know, uh, spending their weekend to, you know, promote uh, our uh, signature Vietnamese uh, dual immersion program. Uh, 
I am look certainly, well, first of all, looking forward to the uh, district spelling bee to be held at San Antonio on February 28th. And yes, uh, March Madness, the district basketball tournament, uh, March uh, 3rd through the 5th. And it certainly was my, my uh, an honor and a pleasure to be able to uh, open those events uh, in my capacity as board president. And uh, lastly, I wanted to, you know, uh, wish every, uh, you know, uh, happy Black History Month. I too did meet with, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Talton, and we had a very productive conversation about what we can do, you know, to start the process of what we can do to uh, honor our commitments to a, you know, uh, diverse, multi-ethnic Alum Rock. Uh, you know, we've been multi-ethnic from the beginning, and uh, we, you know, we are greater than the sum of our parts. So I am, you know, uh, I am committed to uh, an inclusive alum rock that serves all, you know, the fullness of our community. So uh, with that, we'll move to uh, part five, public hearing, special order of business. Uh, in 5.01, public hearing regarding bonding capacity waiver request. Uh, Superintendent Bauer, you have the floor. Okay. I'm gonna ask Mr. Cheng, and maybe it's appropriate to open the hearing. Okay. Because that item comes uh, next. So this is. Okay. Uh, he's ready. He's okay. Ready. Uh, Just so the public. Yes, Mr. Please. Cheng, you have the floor. Thank you, Board President. Um, for this item, I would like to invite Mr. Joe Crump with Dell Scott. Maribel Joe is um, calling in with the number one eight zero five. If you can promote him to the panel. He'll be able to provide some background on this item and also promote Ms. Courtney Jenkins. Uh, she is with uh, Jones Hall and she is our bond counsel. Yes. Mr. Crump, if you can- I can allow him to speak, but not to um, show his screen because he's yeah, calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he's dialing in, so. Yeah. Yeah. Th th this is this is Joe Crump. Um. Yeah. Sorry about the inconvenience. I was having connection issues, so just dialed in right now. Um. But yeah, just to give the board a little bit of background. Um. So going back to you know over the past thirty years, the district has had uh, five successful bond elections, and for the most recent in June of 2016 and November of 2022. Uh, those elections, Measure I and Measure S, both have um, unissued authorization. So Measure S, or, or sorry, Measure I from 2016 has a $100 million of unissued authorization. And then November, Measure S from November 2022 has um, $71.5 million of unissued authorization. Um, and there is a limit. Um, just based on the California legal code for elementary school districts that at any given time, um, they can only have 1.25% of their total assessed valuation um, of bond outstanding. So if you take the total assessed valuation of the district, of all the taxable property in the district, multiply that by 1.25%, then that, that gives you um, the debt limit for an elementary school district like Allen Rock. And so um, currently under that debt limit, the district only has roughly $19 million in available capacity. And there is a way to get around that limit. Um, and it, it's fairly common. So the method is to um, send a waiver request to the California State Board of Education. And typically they approve these requests, I don't think, Dale or I have ever seen a case where a request is not approved as long as we provide the necessary information. And once this waiver request is approved, which will likely happen in May of this year, um, the Department of Education will assign a higher percentage limit, and that will enable the district to issue um, the unissued authorization, authorization for measures I and measure S. Um, so, you know, the resolution before the 
district board tonight is just to um, approve the process of actually applying for that waiver. So, so I hope that makes sense, but happy to answer any questions about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, oh, do, but do we need to? Oh, oh okay. Is I don't the, need to take public. No, Con because okay. that's, that's the hearing. Okay, very good. So with that, I hereby declare the uh, public hearing regarding school bonding capacity waiver request open. Okay. Uh, Louise, is there any members of the public wishing to comment? Board President, there is currently no public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, I will go ahead and close the uh, public hearing regarding school bonding capacity waiver request. Okay, so moving on to item six, superintendent slash board business, 6.01. Approve re resolution number three. Okay, move second. to approve. Okay, so I have a motion from Clerk Quintero, second by uh, Vice President Herrera Loever. Uh, uh, Mr. Chang, would you like to join? Uh, was it present the the resolution? Yes, Mr. Board President. Um, the resolution um, was just uh, explained by Mr. Joe Crump in terms of the waiver that we're requesting to the state of California in order to increase our um, debt limit um, to be able to issue the outstanding bonds. Okay, very well. Uh, Louise, is there any, I'll open the public comment on 6.1. Is there any public comment on item 6.01? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further comments by the public, questions and comments by members of the board. Okay, seeing none, I will move to a vote. You know, how, uh, okay. I wanted oh. to make a comment. Oh, okay. Trustee Chavez, you have the floor. Okay. Um, I know that the voters did, you know, approve to, you know, the bonds, but this waiver, it, it's kind of like attacking Prop 13. So um, because a lot of the taxpayers don't know that they're going to be taxed more and we're kind of like, this is kind of just like rushing things through, I'll be voting no today. Thank you. Okay. Any further comments? By, uh, well, I'll make one comment before we move to the vote. And I just said, I, you know, I, I will say I just said, you know, disagree, Trustee Chavez. I mean, again, uh, you know, I think that Prop 13 and this are two different issues. One is a uh, one is a cap on property tax rates. This is, you know, this is a, a waiver for an increase in the uh, bonding limit. And again, uh, you know, there is Prop 39, which which gives the local uh, local school districts the right to pass bonds at 55 percent. The public has approved these bonds, so you know it's not necessarily you know, uh, you know we are not increasing tax rates. This is some you know this is uh, rather uh, a bonding issue and not a you know, not necessarily a clear you know not necessarily an increase in property taxes. Uh, so I respectfully disagree with that care you know with that comparison. So with that. I'll move to the vote. I'll call you as I see you, uh, Trustee Chavez. No. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Puntero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. The motion passes uh, four to one with Trustee Chavez dissenting. Uh, moving to item 6.02, the ballot for CSBA delegate assembly. Uh, super. I have a motion. Okay. Motion to. <clears throat> Motion to approve. I move that we support uh, board member Ron Lee. Okay. And we write in uh, board member George Sanchez and at uh, whatever time it's appropriate, I would like to make a, a comment. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and I, I have... second, and I also have an additional amendment um, or something to add. Yeah. Uh, apparently, also Jorge Pacheco, we received an email yeah. to also include his name on the list. That, Is that acceptable to the uh, maker of the motion? I would like to speak to that. Okay. 
make the, the case for why uh, we, it may be more it may be wise to go with the two names. Okay. Okay. I, I think just adding it, not necessarily going for the name. So adding George and adding uh, um, Jorge Pacheco to the options, oh. but not necessarily voting for anyone in specific yet. Oh, my motion was to for to move approval for Wong Lee and and uh, a write in for for George Sanchez. Right. So yeah. I'm not going against that. I'm just asking if we can add and write in Jorge Pacheco as well. We have up to. I guess I, like if, if I if you write it in. Then, so let me let me make okay I, okay. I, at what point in time can I explain? Of course, of course. My... So I have a motion in a second. Uh, can or I speak to our motion. Uh, yes, yes, please. So this is voted on by the entire county, and it's not just Alam Rock or, or an east side thing. It's the whole county votes on the representatives that we get. And we've been losing uh, representation on delegate assembly, which is a policy-making body of CSPA. It's a, it's a very, very non... Uh, it's important to have people um, reflect our community in this body. Because uh, when you go to the meetings and it's not reflective of the makeup of the state of California, due to the fact that there's so many rural districts, we have a thousand fifty-six districts in us, and so um, the way in which this works is that everybody votes, yeah. uh, and uh, if you go ahead and cast all six votes, you may wind up lending support to somebody from another district that may wind up bouncing or bumping off. Uh, a, a potential um, individual that might be able to take the perspective of East Los City to the delegate. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, the reason I I moved for I, I've asked for for us to vote for Vonley and George Sanchez because George is very um, uh, well uh, regarded in delegate assembly. So all those people who are already there have served with him for a long time. I think he stands the best shot at getting elected uh, as a right in candidate. I'm not not going to anybody anybody else. I'm just looking at the reality, and I think that it would be it would be us to narrow down our votes so that we make sure that the people we send off um, are able to get in. We don't we unwittingly don't bump them bump them uh -huh. off by giving them support to somebody uh -huh. else. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. the logic. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, of course. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. So I'm in full support of uh, voting for them. Um, I was just requested if we could write in Jorge Pacheco as, um, so maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding. That, that if we write him, yeah. oh, got so it. The whole idea of so we can only write in one. Or no, we can write in as many as you want. Up to six. Um, I think but we the, vote the, for right? just two, right? The, the, that's the motion to vote, to limit our vote to two from our area of of the county so that we can give them the best shot they have. So I'm in support of that. And maybe trust me, I don't know, might be able okay. to explain. So, it's, also, yes. it's also kind of a question, but maybe a clarification. Okay. What I think I'm hearing, I'm understanding is that um the you know for the reasons that you said, um trustee Sanchez has a a higher or a decent likelihood of actually getting onto that body and the unintended consequence of potential of also including Trustee Pacheco would be diminishing the possibility of Mr. Sanchez getting on the board. So it's like, we would be, or I'll say I would be supportive of both of them, but according to what you're saying, I believe, is that supporting one or the other in this case, including Trustee Pacheco diminishes actually the possibility of either of them being put onto that body, but specifically Mr. Sanchez and your I might have made it more confusing. Oh, I just guess the, I was just, oh, I think just a technical, just the technical right. note. Mauer Bell did ask Trustee Puntero to, uh, going forward, to speak up a bit or more so that the yeah. Thank yeah. You. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, but okay. So before I get to my, I will open it up to public comment. Uh, Louise, is there any com comments from the public for item six point oh two? Board President, there is currently no public comment. Okay, so seeing then I'll move to questions and comments from the board. So 
Uh, I just have one question for trusting, you know, given your for Quintero for giving his experience. So I guess that I guess it almost sounds like uh, since we can vote for up to six, right? But the, I guess the problem is that based upon how the votes are counted, you know, if we voted for if we used our full allotment of six, you know, we you know the problem is, you know, it may end up you know, adding a vote to say a uh, candidate that is not representative of our region and therefore, you know, where this tilting the, uh, you know, as I said, tilting the balance. Uh, at least that's that's my understanding of the vote. What happens is they, they may have already collected a bunch of votes in other places uh -huh. and they'll wind up bumping up Okay. Um, people from our uh, our our neck of the woods. Uh, if, take a look at the list. Yeah, I see. We have yeah. one person on the list from our. I know. Our well, I know. <laughs> um, so the it's important to yeah. figure out how do how do we create a path for more voices from our our neck of the woods to to get up there and to speak up. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Trustee Chavez. So since one is on the list. And if you incorporate more, you're watering down that person's vote. So oh, if you okay. only go with one, they have the best chance of winning. Okay. But uh, did you, uh, Trustee yeah. Um, You know, I, as I'm thinking about it, I, I, you know, know fairly well both of these individuals. And I, I do think that Trustee Pacheco has done um, a good job of establishing himself, of building his credibility as a trustee, but I do at the same, and the same with Trustee Sanchez, and but I do think that, at least in my experience, having observed kind of how how the whole body works, I think that what Trustee Quintero is suggesting um, makes sense for me, and I'm I, I, I'm leaning towards supporting that approach with the the statement that I really do believe both. Both of these gentlemen are qualified, are established, are credible candidates, but just strategically, um, I'm leaning towards supporting what uh, Trustee Quintero is proposing. Okay. Uh, for questions or comments on members of the board? I think just to clarify, yeah. now I understood that if we were to write in, we'll be check with them, we're actually voting for him. So it's a um, thank you for clarifying that, um, and I will be yeah. supporting the motion. Okay. So very good. Seeing no further questions or comments uh, from the board, I'll move to a vote. We, and uh, we have a motion from Clerk Quintero, second by Vice President Herrera. So I'll call you as I see you, uh, Trustee Chavez. Uh, give me a second to think about this, okay? I'll come back to you, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. Trustee Chavez. No. Okay, and myself voting aye. The motion passes uh, four to one with Trustee Chavez dissenting. Uh, okay, moving to sec, uh, item 6.03, discussion consideration to approve resolution number 2222-23, authorizing uh, remote virtual teleconference meetings. Uh, Superintendent, you have the floor. Uh, yes, and I have invited Rogelio to join us tonight just so that he can highlight some of the changes in the Brown Act. Um, and also just so that everybody knows there's a minor uh, typo on the resolution. And I'm gonna see, if, Maribel, can you please uh, promote uh, Mr. Ruiz? He alerted me about this and I'm trying to find it should read, uh, uh, it's less than 30 days now because it's still February the 20th if the board approves, right? So there he is. Okay, uh, Mr. Ruiz, you have the floor. Yes, so the resolution before you is, is a resolution that you have passed uh, consistently um, every board meeting to extend the opportunity to hold uh, board meetings virtually. Uh, the governor has uh, signed an order revoking the declaration of the COVID-19 emergency uh, effective at the end of February 28th. And so um, 
from and after March 1st of this year, uh, the board uh, board meetings will have to revert back to in-person uh, meetings um, with uh, specific <laughs> exceptions for uh, remote appearances by individual board members under specific circumstances. And I sent an update to the board and the superintendent about that earlier this week. But this resolution will, uh, in, in case there is a need for more board meetings this month only, this resolution will allow the board to hold those board meetings virtually as you are now, as you are meeting now. Uh, but again, that would only be through February 28th. Okay, very well. Uh, move approval. Okay. Second. Move approval. Okay, uh, we have a motion by uh, Clerk Quintero, second by uh, Trustee Chavez. I will open this item to public comment. Uh, okay, uh, Luis, is there any comment from the public on this item? Board President, there is currently no public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, I'll move to com uh, questions and comments by members of the board. Okay. Any comments or questions by members from the board? Okay, it doesn't look like that. Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> Okay, well, just making sure. Okay, so seeing that, I'll move to the vote. Uh, seeing no further comments or questions uh, from the board, I'll move to the vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Okay, uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Uh, Clerk Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. No. Okay, and myself voting aye. The item passes four to one with Trustee Bejarano dissenting. Uh, yeah, moving to section seven bonds. Uh, item 7.01 approved. Full we'll rule. Okay, second. um, motion by uh, Clerk Quintero, second by uh, Vice President Herrera Loera on 7.01. Uh, Superintendent, with no, is there anything to present? Not really. Who you the board has been okay, very yeah. well. Uh, okay, open the item to public comment. Uh, Luis, is there any comments from uh, members of the public? Or President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further comments from the public, any comments and questions by members of the board? Okay, seeing none, I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loero. Aye. Clerk Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano? Aye. And myself voting aye. Motion passes unanimously, five to zero. Uh, item 7.02, pull we'll rule. Okay. Second. Okay, motion by Clerk Quintero, second by uh, Trustee Chavez. Uh, let's see here. I will open the item to uh, comments from the public. Board President, there is no public comment. Seeing none, questions or comments by members of the board? Seeing none, I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero. Aye. Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Motion passes unanimously, five to zero. Uh, item 7.03. Motion. Uh, motion by Trustee Second. Chavez. A second by Clerk Quintero. Uh, so uh, do I have... Uh, uh, I'll move the, I'll open the item for comments from the public. Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, I'll open it to questions and comments by members of the board. Seeing none, I'll call the vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Uh, Clerk Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes unanimous, unanimously, five to zero. Uh, item 7.04. Motion. Okay, I did hear. Uh, 
motion by a tr uh, clerk Quintero. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Chavez. I'll open the item to uh, public comment. Louise, is there any public comment on item 7.04? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing none, questions and comments by members of the board? Seeing none, I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, mm -hmm. Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Puntero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes five to zero unanimously. Uh, number item 7.05. Okay, motion by Trustee Chavez. Second. Second by Vice President Herrera Loera. Um uh, open to public comment. Is there any public comment on item 7.05? For president, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further comments by uh the, from the public. Any comments and questions by members of the board? Seeing none, I'll call you as I see. I'll move to the vote. Call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clark Puntero. Aye. Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes unanimously five to zero. Uh, go moving to item 7.06. Motion. Uh, I did hear Trustee Chavez. Motion by Trustee Chavez. Second by Clark Puntero. Uh, I'll open the item to public comment. Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further comment from the public. Questions, comments by members of the board? Seeing none, I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Uh, Clark Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Uh, item passes unanimously five to zero. Moving to section eight, instructional services. Uh, item 8.01. Uh, I did hear uh, uh, trust, uh, Clerk Quintero, so motion second. for Clerk Quintero, second by Trustee Chavez. Uh, I'll open the item to comments and questions by the public. Seeing uh, Board Clerk President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, questions or comments by members of the board. Seeing none, I'll move to the vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Uh, Clerk Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes unanimously five to zero. Item 8.02. To... Okay. Motion by second. Trustee Chavez, second by uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Uh, open the item to public comment. Is there any public comment on this, Louise? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, uh, seeing no further comment by the from the public, questions and comments by members of the board, uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. I just want to highlight um, that, you know, we don't just pass resolutions, but we actually follow up with actions. And uh, when we started, Natasha Melendez, you know, talked about uh, her appreciativeness of us hiring her um, as a woman owner of her business. Um, so I look forward to doing, you know, more of that, uh, especially supporting women owned businesses. Um, being a woman, you know, I think sometimes it's like, well, what's a big deal? It's a big yeah, deal big because, deal. Uh, you know, we've, um, we haven't been there um, many years. So just uh, really proud of our district, um, you know, and, and making sure that any opportunity that we get, of course, um, ensuring that the uh, business that is provided um, is quality, which we know it has been. So really happy um, with that. And I'm sure other examples that we have throughout our district so thank you okay for questions or comments by members of the board uh seeing no further questions or comments i'll move to a vote i'll call you as i see you trustee chavez aye uh vice president herrera loera aye uh, clerk Montero. aye uh trustee bejarano aye and myself voting aye item passes unanimously five to zero uh item uh, 8.03 motion. Um, motion by Trustee Chavez, second by Clerk Quintero. I'll open the item to uh, public comment. Louise, is there any uh, members of the public wishing to comment? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay. Uh, okay, seeing no further comments from the public, uh, mm -hmm. questions and comments by members of the board? Uh, trustee, I mean, Vice President Herrera Loera. And I just uh, mentioned on this one, I'm really proud as a mother who has a child who um, is into the arts and education um, with theater. 
you know, I'm really proud of our district for investing and ensuring that um, we highlight this within our district. Um, and I truly believe that it saves lives. So thank you. Okay. Okay. Any further questions and comments by members of the board? Well, I'll just say one thing and that I went to our winter VAPA showcase and I look forward to our spring VAPA showcase. Uh, the arts are an important part of the educational experience. Uh, you know, it makes, you know, ensures the well-roundedness of our children and it, it helps, you know, well, even though we don't necessarily draw the correlation, uh, you know, lessons learned in, in the visual and the performing arts uh, work to help our students in English language arts, social studies, and math and science. So, uh, you know, I am completely in favor of this resolution and always in, in support of our uh, uh, arts education program. So with that, I will move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero. Aye. Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. I am passes unanimously five to zero. Moving on to 8.04. Room Ah, I heard clerk, a motion by Clerk Quintero. Second. Second by Trustee Chavez. Uh, question uh, moved to public comment. Luis, is there any members of the public wishing to comment? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay. Uh, questions and comment by members of the board. Okay, well, I will wrap up by saying bon voyage, and with that, I'll move to the vote. Uh, uh, I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Uh, Clerk Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes unanimously five to zero. Uh, move to it. item 8.05. Okay, I have a motion Sorry. by Trustee Chavez, uh, second by Clerk Quintero. I'll open the item to public comment. Uh, is there any members of the public wishing to comment, Louise? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, with that, I'll open it. Uh, questions and comments by members of the board. Seeing no further comments or questions by members of the board, I'll call to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero? Aye. Trustee Bejarano? Abstain. Okay, and myself voting aye. The vote is uh, uh, the vote is four in favor, zero nay, zero no's, and one abstention. Uh, move to item 8.06. Uh, State of California Parks and Rec. Move to approve. Uh, it's information only. Oh. So there's a so, uh, <laughs> Superintendent Bowers, is there anything to present? Uh, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that, I uh, open I 8.06 to public comment. Any members of the public wishing to comment on items 8.06? 8 uh, 8 Board President, there is no public comment. Okay. Seeing no for public comment, all I'm saying is, uh, you know, I encourage members of the board to read this at their pleasure. Uh, moving to item section. Uh, Nine human resources, item 9.01, resignations. This item is designated information only. Uh, I will open item 9.01 to uh, public comment. Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing none, any questions and or comments by members of the board? Okay, seeing none, all I say is, uh, you know, uh, you may, uh, members of the board may read at their own pleasure. Move to item 9.02. Motion. Motion by Trustee Chavez. Uh, can I hear a second? What item 9.02? Yes. Uh, second. Second by uh, Trustee uh, Bejarano. I will open uh, item 9.02 to uh, public comment. Board President, there is no public comment. Being no further public comment, any comments and questions by members of the board? Okay, seeing no further questions, uh, no further comments or questions by members of the board, I'll move to vote. I'll call you and say, see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero. Aye. 
uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes unanimously, five to zero. Uh, section 10, contracts over $100,000. Okay, item item 10.01, do I? In, Second. Is, is that a motion? And I, okay, motion by Trustee Chavez and item 10.01, second by uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. I'll open the uh, uh, item to public comment. Is there any? Public comment on item 10.01. Board President, there is no public comment. Seeing no further public comment, I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you. Uh, <laughs> Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero. Aye. Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes five to zero unanimously. Uh, moving to item 10.02. Motion. Motion by Trustee Chavez. Second. Second by Clerk Quintero. I'll open to uh, public comment. Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, now uh, questions and comments by members of the board. Seeing none, I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Uh, Clerk Quintero. Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes unanimously by the zero. Move to item 10.03. Motion. Okay. Motion by Trustee Chavez, second by Clerk Quintero. I'll open to public comment. Uh, Louise, is there any public comment in item 10.03? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no further public comment, questions or comments by members of the board. Uh, seeing that, I'll move to a vote. Uh, call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Aye. Uh, <clears throat> Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero. Aye. Trustee Bejarano. Aye. And myself voting aye. Item passes unanimously five to zero. Moving to a, section 11, consent calendar. I, I, Bernie or I have pulled something. Okay. Just to talk about Which one? It. A number? Uh, it was 1109. It was 11.09 to talk about. Okay. Um, so, 11.09. So, do I have a motion on the remainder of the... So, okay, motion to... Second. Okay, motion by Clerk Quintero to approve items 11.01 .01 through 08, and second by Trustee Chavez. Uh, do I have... I'll open it to public comment. Uh, do I have... Uh, is there any... Uh, public comment on items 11.01 .01 through 08. Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing up for public comment, comments or questions by members of the board. Seeing none, I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. Say it again. Can you go to the next person, please? Vice President Herrera Loera. Hi. Clerk Quintero. Aye. Trustee Bejarano? Aye. Uh, Trustee Chavez? Aye. Okay, and myself voting aye. Items 11.01 .01 through 08 are approved uh, unanimous, unanimously, five to zero. So moving to item 11.09. Uh, so I will open, first open the public comment. Is there any public comment on item 11.09? .09? Board President, there is no public comment. Okay, seeing no for public, uh, comments from the public. <clears throat> Questions or comments from the board regarding item 11.09? .09? Trustee Chavez. Um, I guess I'm object objecting again because of the Cesar Chavez launch. And uh, Cesar Chavez is probably best remembered as a labor and civil rights uh, organizer, but he was very anti-Mexican sentiment against the migrant workers whose only desires was to, bar to provide for their family. And he looked at Mexicans as interior and as a nuisance. And the ugly truth about Cesar Chavez is that he's deeply hostile towards what he called in his own words, wetbacks. And he and others called them relentless. They, he was active in pursuing the deportation of the ones that were already here. And he made a lot of enemies and a lot of people did not agree with his tactics. And even his allies didn't agree with him. And 
because of the stubbornness, there was a lot of fallout in that organization, especially in 1970. But these tactics towards the people and the wet line that they used to call it on the border and the way he called uh, immigration on them was horrible. And a lot of the times they um, basically beat up people who were only trying to make a better living for themselves. So I ask you, is this who we really want to look as a role model for the kids? Um, his actions, and I heard one trustee uh, year, several years ago say that's the way that they acted at the time. It wasn't acceptable then, it's not acceptable now. And I'm just asking to reconsider that. And uh, that's all, thank you. Okay. Uh Okay, Vice President Herrera-Loera. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to clarify that I was here at that meeting and I don't remember any of my colleagues saying um, those words that she just mentioned um, and okaying any behavior like that. Um, and I will reiterate, as a daughter of a farm worker who benefited from Cesar Chavez, his leadership, um, and many other leaders that uh, worked alongside um, and also being a resident in one of the communities that he resided in and met with and organized with, um, and many of us continue to benefit from. Um, I am proud of Cesar Chavez. Um, I'm sure just like any one of us, um, there's many areas that, um, you know, he was healing through. Um, I wasn't um, an adult during that time. And uh, I am sorry if uh, Trustee Chavez experienced anything like that directly or indirectly by anybody, um, but I know Cesar Chavez did a lot of work that we I continue to benefit from, and my daughter and my children's children will continue to benefit from. Um, so I am very proud of Cesar Chavez, and I will support um, this resolution, and um, I am glad that our children will get to experience that day. I know I've been out there, um, and it's a beautiful day where our children are proud and happy and smiling, so I'm so excited to come back together in person to have that event there at the Cesar Chavez, I'm sorry, at the uh, School, of Alum, uh, School of Arts and Culture, excuse me. Um, I'm really excited to, to be um, supporting this and that our district is organizing um, and that our children will have all that they need in order to have a successful uh, March and celebration that day. Thank you. Just a quick correct. <laughs> it's a contract, not a resolution. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That we'll be supporting the money. Um, and actually, I do want to highlight the fact that we'll be um, that the School of Arts and Culture has, um, you know, cut this cut the cost of it, and we're saving over six thousand dollars and only paying um, two thousand one hundred seventy two and fifty cents. Uh, so, um, thank you, staff there at uh, the School of Arts and Culture, and our staff for, uh, you know, ensuring that um, our district uh, has. Savings um, also incurs savings um, in this contract. Thank you, uh, President Pham. Okay. So, questions and comments from members of the board? Uh, Trustee Bejarano. Yeah. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, when we look at any individual, anybody that we consider a leader or an exceptional human being throughout the course of history, I, I would venture to say that none of them are perfect in their time or in our time or in their time before them. We're humans and we're fallible. And we, you know, we live within the context of our life, our present time when we live. And so, you know, I don't disagree, according to my understanding of history, some of the things that Trustee Chavez has said are accurate. But I think to characterize them in a, you know, two minute speech as a complete encapsulation of who Cesar Chavez was as an individual is does it um you know it, it's not accurate enough it's it's too small there's much more context with regards to the time what he accomplished what his challenges were who he worked with all those kinds of things it's very contextual and so I actually think that um you know I, I will definitely be supportive of this because I think our community our youth are in desperate need of role models to look to look up to and Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, we have individuals who have established themselves as such and our community sees them as of pillars of what we aspire to in many ways. 
Um, but I would say that I would not be opposed to, in some way, um, incorporating into what we present and a discussion about historical context and and maybe introducing some of what Cesar Chavez was challenged with and, and how he dealt with those challenges, because I think we learn from the past. Certainly, there are things that I could say as a student or, uh, you know, as a as a second grader at Ryan or a fifth grader at McCollum or an eighth grader at Joseph George 30 years ago that nobody would bat an eye at. And if they were to be said now, it's it's going we know now we know different. I, is it Oprah or someone who says, oh, no, I'm sorry, not Oprah. I saw it. I saw Oprah talk about it, but it's I believe it's. Um, uh, I know it's on the tip of my tongue, a, a famous poet who said, when you know better, you do better. My uh, angel. My angel. I knew it was, it was on the tip of my tongue and I heard Oprah talking about it recently. Um, but I think that's the case for this too. And so I do think that with, you know, as we talk about our um, racial equity, ethnic studies, all those things, it's important to include the obvious leaders of our communities in those discussions. But I also think that it's important to have discussions about what that past looked like and the implications on the present, because, you know, our students will, um, you know, potentially be able to transfer some of the learning from then to the realities of the present and move forward with that. So I just wanted to share that, um, but I'll be supporting this item. Okay. For comments, question, Trustee Quintero? I'm Clark Quintero. <laughs> yeah. Um, and to the point, uh, to just go back to the point that if we dig in and we look at people and uh, individuals that are, you know, high profile, we always find the things that were not cool. The granddaddy of the GOP, for example, Abraham Lincoln, we don't see the nasty stuff that he said and he believed in, inscribed in the memorial. We do acknowledge the fact that he nevertheless, regardless of the little, little things that were in his mind that were not cool, um, um, he did. He accomplished a lot of great stuff, and so um, I myself, I have family members who are conflicted. Uh, not, you know, I have some family members who view Sir Chavez as um, an evil person who did harm, and that he come down and pulls them down by the ladder and hurt them. Others um, viewed uh, the UFW and the work that it did as uh, as a great thing, and so. You know, within the same family, you have different different experiences. So I think it's, it's a good exercise that we're engaging in um, because it, it sheds light on this complexity that there is out there. And we're not we're not going to take away the fact that um, you know there's a lot of things that were done based upon the work that he, the Lord of the Huerta, and others did um, began, such as uh, you charging people for the water. Uh, the farm that, that was just a common thing back then. Um, the fact that uh, the the it was brought to light that uh, pesticides were being thrown on on top of farm workers, all that type of stuff is in large part the the fact that those things are not allowed to happen uh, is in large part due to the work that uh, the Chavez, the UFW, the Lord, what all of them did, and so we we I, that also must be acknowledged if we're going to acknowledge the the negative stuff. So yeah, trustee Chavez. Um, it's well documented in the newspaper that they used to put out, uh, and it was called El Malcriado. And he actually, that is my experience because some people read about it. I was there, I experienced it, my husband experienced it, his brother. So there's this hero, but yes, people do good and bad. And I just would like that all sides would be reflected. So give the facts, but give all of the facts, not just one side. And because we're all human, we all err, which I think that it would be also good for the kids to see, hey, this guy did great things, but at the same time, you know, as Trustee Bejarano said, you know, you can improve on it. You can teach the kids, don't do this, don't do that. But um, thank you very much all for your time. Okay, well, seeing no further comments by uh, from members of the board. I'll move to a vote. I'll call you as I see you, Trustee Chavez. 
no secret it's a no i know <laughs> but, it, but it's a roll call vote so it's no secret <laughs> you know uh vice president herrera loera hi her uh clerk puntero hi uh trustee Bihrano. hi and myself voting aye the item passes four to one with trustee chavez dissenting Thank so you. with that, we move to section 12, closed session, item 12.01. We will recess the closed session. The board will recess the closed session at approximately 9 p.m. Open session will resume at the conclusion of closed session. And I know we are sl slightly early, actually. Uh, so, Excuse me, um, Trustee Pam, can you, I didn't uh, capture who made the motion and who seconded it. Can you I please? Said that. The uh, board will recess to close session at approximately. No, I'm asking about the item 1109. Oh, okay. We right. needed a motion in a yeah. second. Oh, I done it. Oh, okay, second. motion. Motion by uh, uh, Quintero, second by Vice President Should Herrera Loera. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Again, no. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Chavez, no. <laughs> Vice President Herrera Loera. Aye. Clerk Quintero? Aye. Uh, Trustee Bejarano? Aye. Okay, motion passes, uh, <laughs> item passes uh, four to one with uh, Trustee Chavez dissenting. So section 12, 12.01, uh, 12 recess to closed session. The board will recess the closed session at approximately 9 p.m. Open session will resume at the conclusion of closed session. Uh, so we'll go to item 12.2, announcement and public comments regarding items to be discussed in closed session. Superintendent Bauer. Do you want public comment? Or oh. Do you want me to read the, the items? I'll read the items first and sure. then I'll read the okay. public comment. Okay, so uh, 12.03, conference with legal counsel um, for potential cases. Uh, it, this is anticipated litigation. Okay. 12.04, oh, uh, 12 um, those uh, existing litigation cases as listed on the agenda. 12.05, conference with labor negotiators, employee organization area. 12.06, public employee appointment, employment, director of facilities, bonds and leases. And 12.07, public employee discipline, Dismissal, release, non-re-election. Okay, I will open it up to public comment. So is there any comments from the public regarding item 12.02? Well, I Board President, there's currently no public comment. Okay, very well. So with that, uh, the uh, board will recess the closed session I, uh, and we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, and we will, the board will meet in closed session at 9.09 p.m. Thank you so much. We'll see you back in open session.
and we yes we have a quorum so with that we move to item 13.01 report of action taken in closed session uh mr ruiz would you please report yes um <laughs> closed session item 12.01 the board by a vote of four to zero with President Pham abstaining, approved resolution number 38-22 slash 33, authorizing the non notice of non-reelection of four certificated probationary employees and directing the superintendent to serve those employees with written notice of their non-reelection no later than March 15th, 2023. Also item 2.0, I'm sorry, 12.07. Um, the board unanimously approved a resolution authorizing the release of one certificated administrator, I'm sorry, two certificated administrators, resolution number 37-22 slash 23 and authorizing and directing the superintendent to provide those employees uh, with written notice of their release by March 15th, 2023. Also item 12.07, the board unanimously approved a statement of charges and notice of intent to dismiss for one certificated employee. Item 12.06, the board unanimously approved the appointment and employment of Mark Fracas as Director of Facilities, Bonds and Leases for the district. And again, that was a, a unanimous vote. There are no further actions to report. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Ruiz. Now, uh, so we move on to the 14 future board agenda request. Request from the Board of Trustees and or from the public request shall be submitted in writing to the superintendent or designee with supporting documents and information, if any, at least one week before the scheduled meeting date. Items submitted less than a week before the scheduled meeting date may be postponed to a later meeting in order to allow sufficient time for consideration and research of the issue. Move to part 15 adjournment. So I adjourn this meeting at 11.02 p.m. We'll see you on the 9th of March. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>